All right. Good morning. I'm going to get us started with a, a few housekeeping notes, if you will. Again, I just want to thank everybody for attending the webinar today. My name is Marshall Graham, and I work with Cal Recycle, and I'm here with Arlene Irahara. Iraharo and Frank Severson to guide us through today's webinar agenda. All attendees at this point uh, are muted and there are no individual videos or the ability to share screens. After each session, we will have a time for quick questions and answers, though it is very unlikely that we'll get to all the questions during the live webinar. And um, Arlene, Frank, and I are definitely committed to getting. Um, feedback to each um, of the questioners. Um, so if there, your question isn't addressed during the webinar itself, we'll do it in follow-up. There's also a lot of information without really any breaks other than our 30-minute lunch. Uh, and however, the webinar is being taped and posted on the web. We will need a little bit of time to make all of the presentations ADA compliant. Um, before posting, so that will take a little bit of time. With that, I'd really like to get started. So not only do we have a day jam-packed with useful information about funding opportunities for recycling manufacturers, we are incredibly fortunate to begin the morning with welcoming remarks from Cal Recycle's new, newly appointed director, Rachel Wagner. Prior to being appointed director by Governor Gavin Newsom, in December of 2020, Rachel served as Deputy Legislative Secretary in the Office of the Governor beginning in 2019. Before that, she worked with the Chief as the Chief, Chief Consultant for the California State Senate Committee on Environmental Quality from 2009 to 2018, where she advised state senators on issues related to environmental protection, including waste reduction, environmental justice, pollution prevention, and hazardous waste. We are so excited to start the year 2021 under her leadership. Please help me welcome Cal Recycles Director, Rachel Wagner. Thank you so much, Marsha. I really am very pleased to be here and very excited about um, this new opportunity for me, but for the state of California as we are moving forward on so many important initiatives here at Cal Recycle. Um, I have joined an incredible team of committed environmentalists um, that are determined and dedicated to serve the state of California um, and um, all of its stakeholders and constituents um, that live here. And I just wanna start by saying thank you to each and every one of you for participating in this webinar today. This is a true sign of your dedication and commitment um, to bringing forward the newest, best ideas to innovate how we deal with not only our solid waste, but recycling and, um, um, and organics waste when we all come together to look for opportunities to partner on um, projects moving forward. So your um, innovation and optimism about potential projects for the future is what is going to truly move California and our recycling system into the future. So thank you each and every one of you for participating in this very important webinar today um, and really showing your partnership with California and Cal Recycle. Um, as you all know, uh, the last several years have put forth a number of very uh, difficult challenges that the state has had to deal with um, impacting our ability to uh, collect and truly recycle the materials that we use here in the state of California. Um, from national sword to the pandemic, many, many challenges that we have not anticipated, but in 2021, we are raring to go to find the solutions to those challenges. So I again want to thank each and every one of you for looking for those opportunities that you can work with us to achieve uh, solutions to our most challenging um, uh, difficulties uh, as we move forward. Um, 
one of the priorities of the Newsom administration is to truly innovate in the area of recycling. And that's everything from the traditional materials in our bottle bill program to organics. Uh, Governor Newsom is very committed to building the circular economy and building it here in the state of California and has asked that I, um, in my capacity as director of CalRecycle, build a strong foundation for a circular economy here in California, which very much is reliant on all of you uh, to working with us to figure out the best solutions um, to the challenges that we're having. Um, so today's webinar, I think, will go a long way to looking for those projects um, and opportunities where we can address some of the challenges that we are facing in building that foundation. But um, we look forward to working with you uh, to um, really test new solutions to build a circular economy here in California. And that's everything from collection to innovation um, in new projects um, to reforming some of our existing programs and working with you to do that. So, Michelle, thank you so much for the opportunity to open up this very important meeting this morning. And again, thank you to the CalRecycle staff for um, conducting this meeting. I know a lot of work goes into building these webinars. Um, and thank you to all of the participants for coming to partner with the state. Thank you tremendously, Rachel, for laying the foundation for today's webinar and for your support of efforts like it, which are all designed to build the state's recycling infrastructure and to assist California recycling manufacturers. With that, we'll move into the rest of, we'll get, we'll, we're gonna dive directly into the program presentations at this point. Cal Recycle, we're gonna start like this, sorry. California's Department of Resources, Recycling and Recovery, or Cal Recycle, provides grants, loans, and incentive payment programs to promote infrastructure development for recycling manufacturing, composting, and anaerobic digestion facilities in California that divert material from landfills and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. To kick things off, we will be hearing about CalRecycle's grant programs presented by Shana Miners from the Financial Resources Management Branch. Welcome, Shana. Thank you, Rochelle. Good morning. And uh, to everybody, thank you so much for joining this Monday morning for these webinars. My name is Shana Miners. I am a grant manager with the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Grant Unit at CalRecycle. Uh, today, I'll be presenting a brief overview of the California Climate Investment Grant Programs administered by CalRecycle. The California Climate Investments are financial programs throughout the state administered by various Shana, Shana I'm going to stop you just for one moment. Yeah, of course. I'm terribly sorry, but I don't think that we have effectively uh, broadcast your screen. So okay. I'm just going to have a pause for a moment until we can get that remedied. Thank you for letting me know. I am so sorry. Oh, there we go. All right, I think you're ready to go now. I apologize for the interruption. Uh, no, sorry about the technical issues. Thank you. Um, so again, my name is Shannon Miners and I am with the California um, uh, Climate Investment Grants Administrator at CalRecycle. So what those are, are financial programs throughout the state administered by various state agencies, not only CalRecycle, to fund projects that reduce greenhouse gas emissions. In addition to CalRecycle, some of the state agencies listed here um, also receive allocations from the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund 
to develop grant and loan programs to help fund projects to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. This is across all sectors of business, including energy, water, air, transportation, and uh, perhaps most relevant to us today, waste management. Power Cycle has developed five California Climate Investment, or CCI, programs that divert materials from landfills in an effort to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, uh, particularly methane. The Organics Grant Program funds composting and digestion projects diverting organic waste from landfills. The Recycled Fiber, Plastic, and Glass Grant Program funds intermediate commodities and recycling manufacturing projects diverting fiber, plastic, and glass. The Food Waste Prevention and Rescue Grant Program funds food waste prevention and rescue projects diverting food waste that would have otherwise gone to the landfill. Our newest program is the Reuse Grant Program. That funds reusable food service wear, packaging, transportation, and wood salvage projects displacing single-use items from being used. In the Community Composting for Green Spaces Grant Program funds community-based composting projects that divert organic waste on a small-scale basis. Each of the different grant programs I mentioned has its own distinct list of eligible applicants. Common ones include local governments, state agencies, entities in California's higher education system's three public segments, qualifying Native American tribes, private for-profit entities, and nonprofits. These are um, the main eligible applicants for each CalRecycle's GHD grant programs. Mostly speaking, we see a majority of cities, counties, and for-profit companies applying to organics grants. Mostly for-profit companies applying to recycled fiber, plastic, and glass. And cities, counties, and nonprofits applying for food waste prevention and rescue. And then we see for-profits applying uh, to the reuse program, and mostly nonprofits applying to the community composting. However, any eligible entity on the distinct list for the relevant specific program can apply for that grant. The eligible costs also vary across each grant program. For the infrastructure grant program, uh, such as organics and recycled fiber, plastic, and glass, we mostly fund the construction of facilities, equipment, and specialized um, equipment. Uh, and specialized machinery. For food waste prevention and rescue, we typically fund refrigeration systems, vehicles, food tracking software, and personnel. Reuse is a new program, but we intend to fund equipment, some construction, and personnel. In community composting, we are funding equipment, personnel, and administration. As this program is unique, where one grantee is administering many composting sites, so administration is a significant portion of that funding. Power Cycle currently has no funding available for new CCI grant cycles. California CCI grant programs are not continuously appropriated by the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. So this means that funding is not guaranteed from year to year. The remaining funds we have already had allocated have been or will be awarded to cycles that have just closed this year through our competitive application process. Power Cycle did not receive an allocation for fiscal year 2020-2021 for CCI grants and also with regards to the fiscal year 2021-2022, Power Cycle was not allocated any funds from the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. This funding is tied to the state budget and the state budget process. This involves the governor's office and the legislature with multiple revisions made, including after public feedback from California constituents to the governor and representatives. Therefore, we are waiting to see if an allocation may arise in the coming months and more information in one moment on where to check for that. Power Cycle uses an internal system to organize the grant applications and management regarding active grants. It is called the Grant Management System, which we affectionately refer to as GMS. When open cycles occur for our grant programs, applicants will create an account on GMS and submit applications and upload sorting documents directly through the GMS portal. To find more information about upcoming cycles when they are available, we suggest 
all stakeholders and anybody interested describe to our GHG reductions listserv listed here in this slide. And more information can also always be found on our website, also listed right here on this slide. Here's a high level overview of the various steps in funding a grant cycle. Applications will go live and applicants should check our website and listserv that I mentioned on the last slide for more information. We typically provide six weeks to complete the application. Once applications are submitted, Tower Cycle staff evaluate and score all the applications, which typically, typically takes about two or three months to complete. Once scoring is finalized, Call Recycle posts the awards at one of the monthly public meetings. Grant agreements are then signed and executed and the grant term begins. These terms will typically run about two or three years. I would like to take a minute to highlight three examples of funded projects. Sanco Services has received a $3 million organics grant to fund equipment vital to the operation of a new anaerobic digestion system under construction in Escondido, California, which is a designated low-income community. It's projected to divert 453,538 tons of food waste from landfills over 20 years and to reduce 163,274 tons of CO2 equivalent. When completed, it should be one of the most advanced facilities in California. This grantee is also executing formal community benefits agreements. Some of their commitments within those agreements include preferential hiring from residents of the surrounding area, robust communication to the local community regarding the project, and also providing free compost. Netafem Irrigation Inc. runs a closed loop recycling solution for used irrigation tubing that serves commercial farming operations in the Central Coast region of California. They received a total of $2,011,647 in grant funds funded through the Recycled Fiber Plastic and Glass Grant Program to expand an established and successful recycling operation of used irrigation tubing, shredding, and palletizing in Fowler, California. From there, it is transported to Fresno, where it is used in the manufacturing of new irrigation tubing, making this a closed loop system. This project is estimated to divert 83,059 tons of materials from landfills and to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 66,447 metric tons of CO2 equivalent. Hope for the Heart used to 329,000 $766 food waste prevention and recovery grant to purchase a 26 foot refrigerated delivery truck, pictured forklift and warehouse handling equipment and a walk-in refrigerator to their 5,000 square foot warehouse facility. As a result, more than 2.4 million new pounds of rescued food was kept out of the California landfill. An important food rescue network in the underserved Southern Alameda County was given an opportunity to grow. With Cal Recycle funding, the project has reduced 2,146.5 metric tons of CO2 equivalent. Those are some of the types of projects that, that we fund. Again, my name is Shana Miners. Thank you so much for your time and attention this morning on a Monday morning. I'm happy to take any follow-up questions. Sounds like those can be submitted directly through the webinar. And also my email address is right there if you'd like to contact me and I'll get um, back to you confirming any answers to any of your follow-up questions. Please go ahead and look at our grant program website for more information and sign up for our listserv um, pictured right there. Uh, so you can find out anytime new funding is available, and you can also provide general um, questions to our GHD reduction listserv. Thank you again so much for your time. Wow. Thank you, Shana. I find it particularly valuable to see the types of programs that have been funded through these grants. I'm also encouraged about the growing number of grant programs and to know that as funding is made available, Cal Recycle is well positioned to implement the programs and get that funding out. While we will be taking questions, we're going to wait until after we've heard from our other 
three presenters, and then we'll have questions for all three presenters. Next, we're going to hear about Cal Recycles loan programs from Bruce Quigley, also from Cal Recycles Financial Resource Management Branch. So let's transition to Bruce here. Marcella, am I up yet? I hear you. And then for your slide, I think you need to. Um, what is it? It's I'm just, presentation I'm mode. You got to share. You there we go. Has it shown up yet? No, you know, down at the bottom, if you put your cursor to the bottom of the slide, and then to the left, a little bit, all the way left, left, no, no, whoop, whoop, go back to the right. This is fun. One more. Right there. Try and click that. Slideshow. There we go. Ah, did I get it? Yep, and then you're going, I don't know if that's the beginning of your slides. <laughs> so go to the beginning, I and then you're going to you're gonna so do the same thing. Um, and then go down and do presentation mode, just like we did before. One more over to the right. I got it. Sorry about oh, that, everybody. Nope. Old dog, new trick. There we go. Show screen. Now do we have it up? You got it, Bruce. Fantastic. All right, everybody. Good morning. My name is Bruce Quigley. I'm a loan officer at um, Cal Recycle. Been with them since 2015. So I'm a relatively newbie to the state of California from the outside sector as a commercial loan officer and also a financial planner for many years. So I have a very diverse background in uh, financial uh, analysis and completing uh, loan applications for our unit. Um, we, I'm going to go through a relatively very simple but easy to understand presentation. I've presented this many times over the last four or five years. And I would encourage you to have your, um, if you want to take a screenshot of something, you can do it, uh, or a, a, a cell phone, because there's a, a real self-explanatory screens, the last two or three of them, regarding our programs, et cetera. Um, I'm going to share with you the nuts and the bolts of the process, and we're kind of known as the money people from the loan aspect. Uh, in our internal unit itself. Um, at, what's up on the screen currently right now is, is you're seeing um, Cal Recycle vision is to inspire and to challenge Californians to achieve the highest weight, rate, waste reduction, recycle and re reuse goals in the nation. Um, there has been a strong push for ever since I've been at the state for uh, a process to get as many recyclables out of the waste stream and get them being reused in other products and applications. Uh, technical difficulty here for a second. There we go. Uh, I am part of the fin uh, financial resources management branch, which is known as FIRM, and our objective is to provide a loan funding to eligible businesses and government entities to achieve the mandated waste reduction goals in California. We currently have uh, we have two loan funding programs. The available programs are as follows: is the greenhouse gas commonly referred to as the GHG Reduction Loan Program. And we also have our Recycling Market Development Zone, RMDZ is its name, Loan Fund itself. The program purposes are relatively very easy to, to go forward and, ah, here we go. There we go. Expand is to expand our um, uh, waste stream, uh, is to establish, excuse me, expand existing and establish new manufacturing facilities in California that increase the diversion of eligible recyclable items such as organics, fiber, plastic, glass, used tires, et cetera, from the landfills with the result being creating marketable products in, in the state of California and beyond that, that measure too. Um, the next slide is very descriptive. It goes through and describes our loan program's criteria. And as you notice, there's the RMDZ program listed on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side is the GHG loan program. There's a lot of similarities between the pro two programs. But what I did was, on the GHG side, is in red represents a difference from what's approvable on the RMDZ side. Both of the programs, in, uh, you can apply for loans up to $2 million for the initial application itself. 
So if you fill out an online application and submit it to us, after you, we take you through a process where we use a variety of in-house Cal Recycle units to confirm your eligibility for our program. So there's a project eligibility and there's also a financial component, which I'm part of in the loan programs itself. So each of the programs allow you an opportunity to borrow up to $2 million in the initial loan application. The maximum borrowing under the RMDZ loan program, however, is $3 million as a cap if it's specifically under that program. And that's a program that's designed to lend money in many zones throughout the state of California. So we go through and determine where your project address is and it's in one of these zones then at least you've met an eligibility, one of the eligibility requirements to apply for a loan. Maximum there is up to $3 million. So an example would be you come in, you do an initial borrowing of $2 million, and then six months thereafter, later, after your program's up and running, your business has established it, then we can lend you up to another million dollars, but you have to go back to another pro a approval process and thing that that's to happen. Under the greenhouse gas program, on the right-hand side, you're going to see the maximum borrowing for business can be up to $5 million under the GHG program. It's a little newer of a program. It has a little bit more flexibility. You can also have a combination of an RMDZ loan of $2 million and a greenhouse gas loan simultaneously of $3 million up to a total of $5 million borrowing. So we have flexibility within which to lend, but remember there's very specific requirements that need to be met under the greenhouse gas loan program, which I'll talk about in just a second here. Loan fee for both programs, $300, a half a point basically is uh, compensates our department back for its expenses, related expenses. Here's the great thing, our interest rate's 4% fixed. And that's extremely competitive when you look at us out in the commercial banking environment, which I came out of originally. So 4% fixed is a great rate. And that is throughout the duration of the loan. Both loans, we can lend you up to 10 years is the amortization period if there is a secured interest to a deed of trust on real estate then the the term can be extended out to 15 years so if you have a project you came in you already own some land you have a building you come in you add a different manufacturing process to it we can give you an amortization period up to 15 years the next category eligible applicants as you can see on the rmbz side is for private and nonprofits. Okay, eligible applicants on the GHC side include both the private and the nonprofits, but it also has a caveat for government agencies to apply to. Permitted use of the funds, and this is what I point out for, uh, so that people have a thorough understanding of this. We are primarily equipment lenders and for improvements that are made that allow for a manufacturing process to be placed into operation. We do provide up to some working capital. So I'll give you an example. If a manufacturer uh, contacts us and needs wants a loan and they're gonna ex expand a new line of manufacturing and recycling industry, then we can provide them with the money that's needed to acquire the equipment, even the real estate up to a million dollars and that can be towards a real estate purchase and the working capital that's needed to make the equipment operational. That means brings it in, it brings it online, and it makes it productive so that it's able to produce its product. And all of these, for both of the programs, the improvements that we make for are funded are related to increased diversion and recycled content products. So we're coming in and we're financing things that do with the recyclability of product, a feedstock of some sort, and makes a final product that's sellable in the state of California and beyond our borders of California too. Um, and then the Last caveat on the bottom down here is that we, under the GHG side, we can't come in and, and refinance working capital. Companies have come to us in the past and have asked us to refinance their debt. Uh, we will consider some debt as a refinance, but no working capital can be financed under the greenhouse gas loan program. It has a specific requirement there. And plus, you must receive what's called a passing greenhouse gas score. So the greenhouse gas loan program is a lot more stringent, at least from the greenhouse gas, being able to prove that whatever manufacturing product you're doing, taking a feedstock, is that you're able to have a substantial or sizable reduction, so that means substantial, some sort of a reduction in the greenhouse gas emissions that's taking place. So this is a great side, uh, uh, slide to have available to you at the end of the presentation to, to take a copy of it, really breaks it down 
pretty uh, pretty easily for both of the programs. I uh, also want to point out too that these are both revolving loan funds. And what that means is that any money that comes to us that's repaid back goes back into a bucket for us to relend. But we don't have an unlimited supply. Um, it's on a first come, first serve basis, basically meaning is that those who apply, go through the approval process and receive it, uh, will be given consideration for receiving money first. Um, there are, however, um, we, we do have a usually a, 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 a sustainable amount of money that's available to lend to businesses. But when you're coming to us, make sure that your project's dirt ready. And what I mean by that is make sure that it's ready to be funded when you, before you go through the application process. Now, the next slide is one I, I, I like to point out to um, anybody who applies for our loan and to get into consideration for, there we go, next one, there we go. There we go, the our approval process and challenges. Traditionally, our loan process from start to finish usually happens, usually anywhere between 90 and 120 days. What that means is, is that from the application process, where we have a full and complete application, where all of the information has been provided to us, we're able to go through, determine the project's eligibility under the programs, and then the financial eligibility has been achieved. And then we take it to an approval process that takes us to loan funding, again, between 90 and 120 days. We look for dirt ready projects. What I mean by that is, is that we traditionally don't finance a lot of the soft costs that are associated with going through a process, say you're gonna start a composting operation and you need to go through permitting or maybe some sort of a CEQA, uh, an environmental analysis that takes place. Those are soft cost of a project, which were traditionally, we look for the applicant to have already funded into the projects. We typically only lend you 75% of your estimated cost of your project too. So if you came to me with a complete project of a million dollars to put a manufacturing line in, we're going to lend you 750000 and we're going to expect you to have $250,000 in that process. So we look for at least a cash contribution of 25%. Okay. So what we use as a process is on the left-hand side, we use our five C's of credit analysis. So we look like a commercial bank. We just don't have all of the requirements that the FDIC and others require us to have. But we do go through and look at these. And those on the left-hand side are pretty self-explanatory if you go down through each of the of the projects themselves. We look for enough, is there enough cash that's gonna be generated from your process to repay our loan? Capital, how much money does your ownership have in the business? Okay, we do, ha we have, and we continue to fund startup operations, but we're going to need to see a sizable capital infusion of money. I call it the cash, the cash, the green, in the business itself. Collateral, um, we look at collateral and we secure it for all for all of our loans. Um, if we're financing it, we're taking a security interest in it. Uh, and that includes any other assets that a business may have in place at that point in time. Um, conditions, um, we look for the fact is that are you in an industry that has um, an expansion or room for growth and you're gonna be able to meet the economic trends and you're um, able to put a business into place. And then character, we look for the experience of management. That's one of the biggest things that we look at. Our experiences on the right-hand side are very straightforward. These are some of the areas where we see a lot of the times that applicants come to us, and unfortunately, we're not able to put a loan together at that particular point in time. Uh, it, it may be uh, something that we evaluate in the future. Um, a lot of it generates is that we see a lot of business in the secondary undercapitalized. Um, when you come to us, Please, I would say this is a, is a real strong positive in your case, is it come to us with a full, complete package. Answer these questions that we have Bruce? here. Yes, yes, Marshall. This is Marshall. Um, we are really pressed for time, so I'm going to ask I'm, if you can wrap up in the next two minutes. Pretty. Quickly. I was going to wrap up. I was just about done. Thanks, Marshall. Appreciate you the uh, reminder. Uh, just make sure you bring to us your projects that are self-explained from start to finish as to what you're going to do and some of these are our experiences are good for you to know because we want you to, when you come to us we want to look at an opportunity to to really help you and what you want to do overall um so please bring us completed deals from that standpoint as to information that's relatively available from you to us and to finalize all of that oops one more screen sorry for the the, the trigger finger there 
This is my contact information. It's available. I'm uh, very easy to reach initially overall. Any messages that are sent on through, be happy to talk to you about your project, um, things that you're considering doing initially overall. Uh, Calorie Cycle and the partners that I work with internally in the various departments, um, we have a great way to provide funds to you and to uh, help you with your, um, your projects. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Bruce, and I am sorry for um, barging in there with you. We have a lot of speakers today, and um, so we're going to have to be tight with our time frame. One of the things that I appreciate learning about from your presentation in particular was the approval process and some of the potential changes, I mean, challenges that our team sees. So again, thank you. In addition to grants and loans, CalRecycle administers two payment pro incentive payment programs for recycling manufacturers. To share an overview of the Plastic Market Development Payment Program, I'd like to introduce Veronica Martin with the Recycling Program Operations Branch. Let's transition here to Veronica. Perfect. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me, Marcelle? We sure can. Thank okay. you. Awesome. I'm just going to jump right in. Um, my name is Veronica Martin. I've been with CalRecycle uh, almost about 14 years now, and I've been doing PMDP since I want to say um, 2010, so about 11 years now. So um, let's just get right into it. Um, sorry, I keep getting pop ups. <laughs> Okay, so um, the intent and goal of PMDP is um, to incentivize um, payment to manufacturers for new products created. It also encourages increased use of California generated recycled container materials. It keeps jobs in California and it closes the loop. A little bit of an overview. Um, the program was created as a result of AB 3056. This was back in 2006. The intent of the bill was to develop California's market for recycled empty plastic beverage containers using unredeemed deposit money. Um, back then, up to $150 per ton um, would be paid out to a certified entity, that's a processor, um, who washes and produces flakes or pellets and a product manufacturer using the plastic material from the certified entity to manufacture a plastic product in the state of California. In 2007, the program began with five certified reclaimers and 20 plastic product manufacturers. As of January 1st of this year, the program currently has 13 reclaimers and 58 plastic product manufacturers participating in the program. Since the program's inception, CalRecycle has made over $132 million in payments to both certified entities and product manufacturers. Our program is set to sunset on January 1st, 2023. Um, part of the program is our claims process. So to be eligible for payment, um, certified entities and product manufacturers will submit a plastic MDP claim form along with their invoices for every calendar, I'm sorry, for each calendar quarter in which the payment is being claimed. Um, they need to be postmarked no later than the 10th day of the second month following the reporting quarter. So for example, um, we're now entering fourth quarter, so that's actually due on February 10th of this year. Claims postmarked after the date or incomplete claims will be denied payment. Within 20 days after CalRecycle completes the review and processing of the claims, CalRecycle will notify all the claimants of how much they're getting. And we just wanted to highlight some of um, our PMDP people. This is Carbon Light Industries out in Ontario, I believe. Um, so this is kind of an overview they've allowed us to share. And then we have some of the products. And um, we have Niagara, we have Bottle Box, Ampor in the Middle, Nursery Supplies, um, Epic Plastics, and I believe that's Telco. 
And here's my contact information. Um, Susie Lee also is my backup. So any questions, um, get, feel free to give us a call, email us. Uh, we're always available. Thank you guys so much. That's it for me. Thank you tremendously, Veronica. This You're program, welcome. thank you. This program serves as a long-standing and effective driver for increased plastic recycling manufacturing. In addition to seeing an example of the participating manufacturers, I really appreciated seeing the various types of products made from the participating manufacturers. Last, but certainly not least, we will hear about Cal Recycles Tire Incentive Program from Nick Amante with the Financial Resources, Resources Management Branch. Please welcome Nick. Hi, good morning. Can you hear me okay? Fantastic. Awesome. Good morning. My name is Nick Amante. I'm the lead grant manager over the Tire Incentive Program. I just want to take a quick second and thank uh, the local assistance market development branch for allowing me to present my program as well as Marshall and Arlene and the rest of the team for all their hard work behind the scenes. So what is the Tire Incentive Program? The Tire Incentive Program is a successful competitive market development grant program that provides a reimbursement as an incentive payment to eligible businesses that use crumb rubber and eligible products or substitute crumb rubber for virgin rubber, plastic, or other raw materials and products that are sold. In terms of funding, we have 3.25 million available for, for fiscal years 21-22, which is our upcoming solicitation that I will, that I will highlight um, later on in this presentation, as well as 3.6 million for our 2022-23 fiscal year. It's $25,000 minimum grant award and a $500,000 maximum grant award. We provide the reimbursement quarterly to our grantees via the incentive. Eligible applicants include manufacturers that produce an eligible product, manufacturers of devulcanized rubber, manufacturers that produce calendar rubber sheet products, and rubber compounders. Some of the products that are eligible, um, but are certainly not limited to, there's flooring, we have flooring underlayment, rubberized flooring, various building products, various traffic devices, and a myriad of other products that fall into that other category. And this slide here is the tire derived product catalog. It is a, is, it is a tremendous tool. It is an online interactive cal catalog that's designed to, to raise awareness about the broad range of products that are made from recycled tires. You can bear with me for one second here. I'm going to go ahead and open this, show you what this looks like. So here it is. Um, again, it's an online interactive catalog. I wanted to walk you through, for example, let's say you were interested in traffic related products. Um, here's the table of contents with all the different products here. I'm just going to click into one just to kind of show you how this works online. Click in here and you can see um, some of the traffic re related products that are actually part of our grant program. Um, this is a very useful tool to be able to see um, some of the real world applications of what we fund. Another important um, section on this, I'm just gonna hit it very, very quickly, is our Appendix B, our TDP case studies. So these here are actually some of our grantees that participate in the tire incentive program. Here you can see one grantee that uses ADA reducers. I'll just click through one more just to give you another example of how, how much of a vary um, from one product to the next. Um, this is another grantee that uses um, couplings and some of the work that they did with those couplings. So again, the the TDP catalog is a very useful resource in order to in order to view those um, those products that are a part of our grant program. So, getting back to the tire incentive program, um, here are a few of the uh, critical requirements. First, grantees are required to use only California generated chrome rubber from California waste tire processors. Twofold, the applicants must be California based 
or if they are in another state, they must be incorporated in another state qualified to do business in California. And that manufacturing facility must be here in California. Applicants also must have been operational for at least three years. And application and reimbursement and documentation is subject to review and audit. And last but not least, the incentives are not to increase management and our officer compensation. Um, grantees can pass on all or portion of the incentive to the end purchaser, or they can use the incentive for a, a myriad of other TDP production and selling related expenses. So one of the most important slides here is our reimbursement. Um, these are our reimbursement categories, our products, and the incentive amounts. So for the first category is our TDP, uh, Tide Ride product, which is a, an existing or a new and improved TDP. And for that category, we reimburse 10 cents for the crumb rubber sold in those eligible products. The second category um, has um, two, two categories in there. Uh, the first one is the feedstock conversion which is um, an existing or a new and improved product that's being manufactured currently with some type of virgin material, whether that's rubber, plastic, um, and that will be substituted with at least 5% crumb rubber. Um, the other category in there is devulcanized rubber, um, which also receives the 40 cent incentive. Last but not least is our fine mesh category. This is for an a existing or new and improved product that will use fine mesh, and um, we, we determine fine mesh greater than 50. And for that, uh, the incentive is 50 cents. The application process, um, applicants will submit an application using CalRecycle's online grant management system. Um, you will create a profile in there and that's where it's our module um, where all of the um, application documents will be uploaded. So the application information will include contact and business information, most recent federal tax returns and appropriate business and product information. Uh, please note though that tax return and other proprietary information such as um, sales and um, product development are appropriately labeled uh, as trade secret consistent with our public resource code section 40062. Here's our tentative timeline for the next solicitation that I was mentioning for 3.25 million um, in the previous slide. So April of this year, we'll post notice of funds available, uh, the application and related instructions on our website. Um, this is where you will see the instructions for the grant management system module that I highlighted in the previous slide. Following that in May is our question and answer period. Uh, we anticipate applications will be due in July. Um, staff will then conduct the application review in August and September with the hope of getting those turned back around for executed grant agreements to be distributed sometime in November. Um, the grant term will end April 1, 2024. Each of the tire incentive program cycles are two-year grants. So for more information, uh, please refer to the tire incentive program webpage here. Um, secondly, and uh, very importantly, um, I would highly recommend any interested uh, parties to subscribe to the TIP listserv. Um, this is where we will send out um, all of the funding information, any criteria changes, any and everything related to TIP that is important will be sent through this listserv. Last, if you have any questions that are program specific, please feel free to contact me here at my email or my phone number. And with that, concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you tremendously, Nick. This is another longstanding, effective market incentive for tire recycling manufacturing. I especially liked learning about the connection between this funding program and the marketing of the related products that you showed us. At this point, we're going to be able to take two questions so that we can stay within our time frame. So Nick, I'm going to go ahead and, oh, you got it. I'm going to turn it over to Frank and Arlene to take the two questions. And then, like I said earlier, for those that didn't hear, we are likely not to get all the questions uh, as a part of the live webinar, but we will make sure that all the questions are addressed in follow-up. With that, This is Frank Severson, and we have a question from Nicole Tai. 
or it looks more like a statement, but we'll see if somebody can answer it. It says, San Francisco is working on an innovative program that uses underutilized Caltrans land, finally recognizing the inability of any new reuse program to start up in the Bay Area due to extreme real estate costs. Has Calrie Cycle discussed this issue specific to the Bay Area and other extremely high real estate value areas around the state? I am interested in seeing a discussion about public lands being sold at BMR or leased at BMR to reuse facilities to enable them to start up or in some cases continue operations. We are losing reuse facilities due to increased commercial sector rents, lack of opportunities, support and innovation from the governmental level when it comes to real estate. The new reuse grant program is an excellent step in the right direction, but two years is a long time to wait for the assistance from the state of an entire industry. 65 inches are also marked down right now. Normal price on them are 829. They're rolled back to 454, but it's scary. I need everybody to pretty please mute their voices, I guess. Sorry about that. So Frank read a comment from Nicole, and we're going to look for um, one other question that maybe the panelists can answer. All right, I think we're going to go ahead and move on um, to continue our agenda. While we figure out uh, the workings of our, our questions and answers. So next, the Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development, or GoBiz, offers a range of no-cost consultation services to business owners, including attraction, retention, expansion services, site selection, permit assistance, regulatory guidance, small and small business assistance, also international trade development, and assistance with state government. Today, to share about these opportunities, we have the great opportunity to hear from Poonam Patel, Assistant Deputy Director. Please help me welcome Poonam. Hello, thank you for that introduction, Marcel. Can you hear me okay? Absolutely, thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you uh, for letting us join um, this very important webinar to share our services and programs. As Marshall mentioned, my name is Poonam Patel. I work at the Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development. It's a mouthful, so we just go by GoBiz. Uh, and there's a lot of different services that we provide to help businesses um, in the state of California. And I'm going to just give you a brief tour of the different units within um, our, our office and then get right into some um, incentive programs um, that can be helpful for businesses here in California. Uh, you're going to be hearing a lot from our other program partners at other state agencies, so I'm only really going to touch on a, a couple of them um, that aren't going to be covered later on. So let me just go to my next screen here. Okay, so um, our general mission at GoBiz is to be a singular point of contact for economic development and job creation efforts in the state. Um, as Marshall mentioned, the way that we do that is in a number of different services. Um, so we have uh, the team that I specifically work for, the business investment services side. We work directly with companies to help them navigate through different resource programs. A lot of the resource programs that you're going to hear about today and have already heard about, our team um, can work with companies directly to help navigate 
um, you through those programs, depending on your different operations and activities that you're going to have here in California. Um, what we also do is help with site selection. So a lot of companies that are looking for sites here in California will actually get a sense of what their site requirements are going to be and work with uh, an, a, a vast network of local economic development partners that are spread out across the state um, to really assess sites that would be um, of best use for the companies. Um, so that is a free process that we offer to businesses. Of course, you know, a lot of companies are already working with um, real estate brokers or site selection firms to do that, and we're happy to work with those um, firms as well. Um, oftentimes, we're just a general uh, first stop shop for businesses to just get connected to anything related to government, and so happy to facilitate and point businesses in the right direction on that front as well. Um, as I mentioned, we have some other units to really help with job creation and economic development efforts in the state. Um, we have a permitting assistance team that's really been set up to help um, educate and um, help businesses understand what uh, permitting requirements they're going to need to get up and running. and permitting very broad uh, in general to just mean anything uh, under the regulatory compliance umbrella, really from certifications, licenses, um, to different registrations that uh, businesses need to go through in the state of California. Um, but they also serve as third party mediators to help businesses get through a lot of the processes that we have. Um, a lot of their strength comes from, um, you know, setting up pre-application meetings on, on, on a on the onset of a project to make sure that all the different regulatory parties at the local, state, or federal level that are going to have a touch on a project are all called in the beginning um, to understand time deliverables um, and, and really understand, you know, what the pro and get the company to understand what the process is going to look like so that everyone is on the same page on the onset. Uh, so really stress um, the importance of, of doing that with our team if that's of need for you as a business. Um, the other aspect, you know, with some of the other focuses that we have at GoBiz, we have an international affairs and trade team that's been really set up to help guide our foreign direct investments and efforts here in the state of California. Um, we have a number of different trade representatives um, that all collectively um, help with different foreign direct investment opportunities in California, but also help companies that are trying to get foreign presence in different foreign markets as well. Um, they can also help with any exporting or importing questions that companies have um, and they worked uh, collectively with the lieutenant governor's office um, who sets our uh, international policy agenda um, to really help um, uh, you know point uh, businesses to different resource programs that can make uh, companies successful in different foreign markets we also have a small business team the office of small business advocate they have been on the forefront and center um, with COVID-19 relief efforts for our small businesses here in California pointing them to different um, programs like grant opportunities Communities. Um, we just had a new COVID uh, relief grant that we just set up to really assist um, businesses um, uh, get funding um, who didn't typically or what weren't able to access traditional funding through the PPP loans or small business loans um, to really assist them in that effort with actual grants um, instead of loans. Um, so that's uh, a big focus of theirs right now, but they also help businesses with procurement opportunities, um, doing business with the state. Um, they work for very closely with our Department of General Services, um, who uh, handles our procurement process and can really um, get uh, uh, educate companies on how to get on the small business certification list so that um, state agencies uh, can um, procure uh, materials from those lists. Um, we also have a couple of other different programs within GoBiz um, that are more uh, focused in, in their efforts. We have a film and tax credit commission. We've also got a uh, California competes tax credit program, which I'm going to go over a little bit more in the next slide. And then we've also got a zero emissions vehicle team to help um, with the industry promotion of ZEV, um, but also help. Uh, they've been very instrumental in helping with permitting and getting our hydrogen fueling stations up and running. Um, lots more from that aspect, but I think those are kind of the, the uh, nuts and bolts of who we are and what we do and happy to um, engage with you all um, in the aftermath of this um, and, and connect you to the right group so we can uh, make sure that you're, you're successful here in California.
Um, so I'm going to talk about our first program, which is the California Competes Tax Credit Program. This is a corporate income tax credit um, that is based upon um, the projection of job creation and investments that are going to happen in the next five years. Uh, the California Competes uh, Tax Credit Program has some competitive aspects to it. So this is a program that's specifically incentivizing employers and companies to create jobs here, make investments, and they're essentially applying to this income tax credit program because um, you know they're making the case that but for this program um, their project wouldn't likely happen here so they have out-of-state uh, competition perhaps or they or out of country for that matter and they're really making the case that they need this credit to help um, with their investment um, opportunities here in California this can also be a company that's already here in California and perhaps um, but for this incentive program um, you know their next expansion project may not likely happen here or they would have to close down operations altogether there are also considerations for projects that occur in a high poverty or high High unemployment area um, and and those are also seen as competitive in that aspect so we get 180 million we get 180 million in corporate income tax credits to give out um, each a fiscal year and in California when we say fiscal year we mean uh, July 1st to June 30th um, and we split that allocation up into three um, application rounds um, the first round that we had was actually in August uh, where the today is the last day for our second round for applications and when we've got a third round it, that's coming up in March where we're gonna have 71 million available plus any unallocated amounts from previous application um, periods. Um, what's really, um, you know, one thing I did want to mention in terms of this program, obviously this is meant for companies that are going to be seeing themselves as profitable in the next five years um, and, and would be able to utilize this credit in that vein. Um, however, you know, there are some budgetary considerations and negotiations that are happening, uh, happening right now with the new budget that was announced last week um, by the governor, and that's really to increase the amount of credit that would be available by 90 million in both this fiscal year and next fiscal year. So this, is what, this would be an early action item that would be considered. And so that would actually increase the amount of funds that we would have for the corporate income tax side of things. But for companies that maybe don't see themselves as profitable, as I mentioned, and may need, um, you know, just upfront cash in terms of a grant. There is also a carve out in the budget and consideration to have um, a 250 million grant program to help increase business investment here in California. It would still be run out of our Cal Competes program um, with a more targeted focus um, that you know those logistics are still being sorted out. If this were to be approved, however, um, we could um, be able to uh, start administering grants this year as well. Um, so that's our California Competes tax credit program. Definitely one that you guys um, should take more of a look at. Um, they have very helpful information on the website there and I've provided that uh, below on the slide. And, and we wanna make sure that you guys have, um, you know, as much information as you can to really assess if this is the right program for you to apply for. Uh, the other program that we have that's also a corporate income tax credit is our research and development income tax credit program. If you're familiar with the federal um, research and development um, tax credit program, the state just kind of piggybacks off of that one, but for um, California um, expenses for consideration. And this is available for taxpayers that are engaged in qualified research activities. Um, this can include wage supplies, contract research costs. This can even be used for third party expenses. So if you're not doing the R&D directly, but you're contracting out to a third-party entity to do your R&D, this can also be um, uh, looked at from that angle as well. Um, so definitely a very popular program here in California. A lot of our um, companies that are engaged in R&D utilize this program um, uh, quite frequently. And there isn't an application for this program. It's um, something that uh, businesses claim when they file their uh, income tax returns with the Franchise Tax Board here in California. Next program is a partial sales and use tax exemption. You're actually going to hear about 
another sales and use tax exemption program from the treasurer's office. Um, this one, however, is more general for any type of manufacturing activity. They actually have a carve out for agricultural operations as well. Um, and that includes uh, for equipment purchases of farm equipment and machinery. Uh, essentially, if you fall within the North American industry classification codes, the three series codes, um, uh, then you would be eligible for this program to apply for the general manufacturing partial sales and use tax exemption that's set at 3.9 percent so that would exempt you from a portion of the state um, sales and use tax um, this it, there is an application for this again as long as you meet that eligibility definition of meeting that industry classification code you would be able to utilize this and it's claimed when you're purchasing equipment it's fairly simple it's like filling out a, a one-page resale certificate form that you provide to your vendor when you're ready to apply apply to um, to take on to um, to utilize this exemption at the point of sale uh, and again this is administered by our Department of Tax and Fee Administration if you haven't heard of this about this program before and you've already made equipment purchases in previous years um, you can actually can go ret retroactive on this program and claim um, you know exemptions from previous purchases that you've made so very helpful on that front as well and this department actually has a get it in writing program so you can write to them um, if you're not sure if the equipment purchase that you're making fall within um, the eligibility criteria there and they will actually write you back um, letting you know what does qualify so very helpful from that standpoint as well um, so there's a lot more in, in, uh, incentives that I can go over. Of course, you're going to hear from a lot of the agency partners today. And we're also going to have um, on our website, we already have um, an, a place where you can look up these incentives as well. Um, we have uh, on our landing page at GoBiz um, separated these, uh, these incentives by different industry groups, but also on our business portal, we have an incentive web page that organizes um, these programs by operations activities um, and just general incentive type as well. Um, so that's uh, all that I had for you to share. Again, I think the best thing for businesses to just be mindful of is um, to get in contact with us. That's really what our job is, is to help direct and, and steer businesses to the right programs that would make sense for them based on their operations, activities, or eligibility. Um, that's really what our team is specializes in doing. Um, in addition to, of course, the site selection um, focus that we have to to help companies find a site, which I know is, is a very crucial crucial part of um, uh, getting uh, and obtaining funding for some of these other programs, especially the cow recycle loans that um, that um, you guys are learning about right now, too. So um, just want to thank uh, the cow recycle team for including us in this call and this webinar and uh, look forward to future engagements with you all going forward. Thank you. Excellent presentation, Poonam. Thank you. I can personally attest that for all the businesses, your team has referred to the Cal Recycle Business Assistance Team and our referrals to GoBiz. Everyone involved has been impressed and appreciates the comprehensive assistance that GoBiz provides. With this, we're now going to take a couple of questions and one that I'll tee up that has come in. And I think that it it may be from our first panel, but it fits nicely in this one as well. Uh, so the question is, can someone discuss the role of RMDZ administrators in facilitating successful market development deals? So basically, how does CalRecycle, you know, market? these grants and loans programs and how are we receptive to businesses interested in them with that i'm going to turn it over to frank for a response gobiz is an extremely important partner of ours we also have other important partners and one of those are our zone administrators we have 39 recycling market development zones throughout the state and what they do is they are local experts on Cal Recycle and other programs that help recyclers start their companies, expand their companies, and they work closely with us here at Cal Recycle. We have a business assistance team 
who assists the zone administrators directly. And between the zone administrators themselves and CalRecycle, we make sure that every manufacturer who wants to site or expand in the state of California knows about every grant and loan program that they are eligible for. So thank you, Steve Lautze, the former president of the California Association of Recycling Market Development Zones for bringing up that question. Thank you, Frank. And thank you again, Poonam. Next, we have the unique opportunity to hear directly from a recycling manufacturer about the recycling manufacturing process and experiences participating in a number of the business incentive programs we've learned about thus far. Our Planet Earth is an innovative manufacturing reusing post-consumer plastic as a feedstock to produce high quality packaging with a low carbon footprint. It is with great pleasure that I introduce Robert Davidoux, Our Planet Earth's CEO. Please help me welcome Robert. See. Yeah, you're can doing you, great. I can, can you see, see your here? screen, but not quite the presentation yet. Okay, I need to grab that. I actually had it up on my large right. computer screen. Um, my camera's on my laptop. <laughs> you're okay. I didn't get the prompt to take the presentation from one to the other. So give me one second here. You're fine. Thank you. Grab the presentation. Really appreciate it. All right. And okay. Can everybody see the presentation? Yeah. Very nice. And I'm going to get out of here and let you do your thing. All right. Let me see here. Whoops. I think we might have lost you. Mm. Thanks for your patience, everyone. Looks like we've had a little snafu, but I see Bob coming back. All right, Bob, can you hear me? Okay, we're, we're still working on it. Bob, we're trying to unmute you. So Bob, it looks like you're self muted. It says he's talking. Oh. 
Nope, that's me. While we figure out our technical difficulties, I think if Robert um, Meyer is on, we can move to the next presentation. Look at you. All right. Let me let me properly introduce you. I can't hear you. Seems like you might be muted, which we could have done. Let's see. Is he unmuted? No. All, All right. right. Okay, let me, yes, I can hear you now. So let me introduce you really quickly and thanks for being patient. Oh. All right. The Ent Employment Training Panel or ETP provides funding to employers to assist in upgrading the skills of their workers through training that leads to good paying long-term jobs. Today to share this program, we have the Director of Economic Development, Robert Meyer. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and I hope that you're now looking at my PowerPoint. Is that correct? Beautiful. Awesome. Okay, so in the interest of time, I'm going to go through basically a high level of what ETP is, some updates um, on some new programs that we have for this fiscal year, uh, obviously impacted by COVID, and then answer a few questions. Um, I'd like to thank Cal Recycle for hosting this, um, for certainly all the uh, participants uh, that are presenting, uh, as well as some of our economic and workforce development partners, uh, both state agencies, um, and then really particularly the employers that are on the, on the panel today. I've had the chance to work with a couple of the companies that are presenting and uh, really, really want to um, uh, make sure that you take heed to their experience uh, working here and and hopefully, uh, you know, information is valuable for you. So um, ETP, very simply, we're a state agency and we pay for job skills training costs. We use a pay for performance contract unlike uh, grants or tax incentives, there's actually a contract that structures the cost uh, of job skills training that is paid to the contractor. So uh, it's you know very, very straightforward in terms of what it covers. Uh, we like to think that it's the best kept secret in California um, and uh, has a strong impact on the employers that we work with. Um, we have a couple links here. Um, we have contracts that are active and you can, as an employer, contact any of them that have the available training that you might be interested in and essentially sign up if you're an eligible employer. We start our entire process with an interactive orientation um, done by one of our colleagues, Renee Pierce. She's exceptional at providing information for, for employers and for uh, you know educating them on the program and whether or not it's a good fit. So start there. Um, we do provide end-to-end -end technical assistance and help people uh, from the what if conversation, the very initial, I'm looking at it with my realtor or my uh, a consultant or a training partner, and that's probably involving our team or GoBiz or another business assistance team from another agency. Um, and, and that translates all the way through to a contract and we'll hear some of our success stories uh, later. This is just where our funds come from. It's a tax, $7 per worker per year aggregated. We had $80 million anticipating the impact of COVID uh, for this fiscal year. We're going to spend all of that. Right now, we have a little over $29 million remaining. And while that sounds like a lot, we have about a, over $100 million in demand. Um, and that's even refined to some of the panel's priorities that we've adjusted to this year. So it's in demand. If you're interested in funding, we can definitely help you out. Basic eligibility. Um, we work primarily with employers, so private uh, for-profit employers, uh, training their own workers is the majority of the work that we do. We also work with a variety of what are called multiple employer contractors, and these are chambers of commerce, economic development corporations, training agencies, including community colleges, um, and the workforce development boards. This is the boards themselves and sometimes the JTPAs or 
uh, funded programs uh, via the governor's discretionary wheel of funding. Um, all of those entities mean that there is funding throughout the state. And particularly for manufacturers, if you're interested in training and upskilling your workers, there are programs listed throughout the state uh, that can help you or support you. And if you reach out to our team, we can make that connection for you. Basic eligibility for employers, if you're subject to the employment training tax, your accountant will know this. You don't have to know this. Basically, all private for-profit employers are subject to the tax. If you're not sure, you'd like some background, we can help you and uh, establish your eligibility for the program and where you might fit. Um, basically, what we fund is the training for new and existing workers. So if you're hiring or planning to hire, this includes job creation. Um, you want to upskill existing workers and create uh, new worker opportunities behind that. We do that. Um, we do train individuals that are completely unemployed, um, and that's called a new hire training. Um, we work with apprenticeship and journey worker training, funding almost over $20 million of apprenticeship training a year. Um, we do also offer training for small business owners in entrepreneurial skills that want to learn to operate their business better, learn a little bit more about the sustainability and the stewardship required to uh, be a clean and uh, a green employer in the state. So if you're interested in any of those aspects of it, we can definitely connect you and help you. Um, the training that we fund is basically job skills. It has to be tailored to the needs of the employer. That can mean it's content. It can mean uh, how we do business. So you have the employers have really drive the content that's provided to its employees. If it's legally mandated or it's free, um, we won't reimburse that training. So there has to be a, an incentive for it, and we're basically matching your investment. Um, we provide a, a great deal of flexibility on how training is delivered, particularly in COVID. And one of the main features of this program is it allows the employer to decide who does this training. This could be their own training staff, a community college instructor, equipment training providers. So if you buy a new piece of equipment and you're working with CAPA on a sales tax exemption, perhaps, you know, hiring the, the training staff from the employer is really, really good. Um, it's a great opportunity to work forward. Um, there is a post-training retention period required. This means basically they're trained for their job and then they work after training is finished. Once they're done with that retention period, they earn. And then we do have a uh, in-kind contribution that's not cash on hand. Um, you'll see here, um, this is the wage requirement. So while they're working full-time after wages are done or after their training is finished, they will earn these wages. So we are looking to, to make sure that you exceed these requirements and we'll write the contract to the wages you actually pay during retention. The reimbursement, this is where a lot of people tune out. The basic thing is the amount of funding for ETP is just the number of total uh, training hours that you provide. Oops. I'm getting an alert that I'm not showing my screen. Is that correct? It was true, Robert. That was my fault. Okay. But it's, well, it's corrected I'm, now. Corrected now. Okay, perfect. So let's go back to the cost of the training. Um, for employers training their own workers, the real cost of training is actually your cost. What we will reimburse is basically based on the number of hours of training provided times a, a reimbursement rate. That's, you know, that's, so it's very simple to sort of get an estimate. Um, the contract is gonna approve very flexible terms in terms of how much training you're providing per worker. What we will try and do is maximize your ability to earn this reimbursement. Most importantly, that the training is effective to the needs of your company. So, uh, you know, we'll get into more detail in this in our interactive orientation. Here are the rates, for example. CBT, where it's independent of uh, an actual instructor, is lower at $9 an hour. Um, our, most of our training is really done at $23 an hour per trainee, per training hour. So if you have 10 people in the class, it's 10 times 23 for each hour of training that they receive. Um, here's our process. It's very simple. We're going to qualify you. Uh, we're, well, we'll teach you about the program first. We'll then train you in, in, and help you uh, support the preliminary application, very basic application. Um, we'll assign you to a site visit at one of our four regional offices, and there you'll work one-on-one -on -one with an analyst um, to write the contract. And we do a bulk of the writing. We're gonna get the information from you, 
and make sure that it's accurate and reflects your training. But then uh, once that's done, it's gonna be put forward to the panel for review. And then once it's approved, training can begin. It's very important to understand that we have to have the contract approved before we can uh, have you provide training. Um, so we'll go through that again you know, in, in greater detail. We have two projects that we work closely with that are presenting today, Cal Plant and Our Planet uh, Earth. Both really, really exciting projects. They're, they really um, exemplify what manufacturing you know, is happening and how we can include an increased level of stewardship and recycling, um, use of recycled materials into these products and really lead in an innovative sort of way. So uh, we're very proud of both of these. And in, in each case, the company identified the training that it wanted to provide, uh, really developed it around its own processes. And uh, you know we're very proud of both of these contracts. So uh, you'll hear, learn a little bit, a little bit more about them today, I hope. Um, this year, obviously with COVID impact, uh, it has severely limited the number of contracts that we have been able to fund, uh, as well as the direction in which they are they're working. The um, uh, the, the principal area that we that we worked with now is this COVID response plan. It's primarily geared towards the food uh, supply chain manufacturing. So this is uh, beverage, uh, product packaging, things like that that are really around the, the food supply chain, uh, as well as agriculture and healthcare. So we'll go a little bit into that. We still support job creation uh, and critical proposal development through uh, our partnership with GoBiz. Um, and then we also have a program called Respond, where we are working with uh, impacts originally uh, started for drought, but now cover fire and earthquake and COVID. Um, so while this is, you know, a lot of disaster in California, really this is a, a, a program designed to help companies adapt and overcome the impacts of, of these natural disasters. Uh, and we have really strong projects that, you know, they're success stories, really. Um, so our emphasis always will be manufacturing. That's how the program started. So if you are a manufacturer and you're not sure how you fit, you can please definitely reach out to us. Um, regarding the project caps, we narrowed them down. This is just to show you that we have them. Don't focus on this much uh, as much as, as what your real training needs are. Um, these are the industry sectors for the response plan. Again, these are this is currently what we are funding in our general program chain. And more questions about it, we can outline that for you. Um, we have two special programs that we're working in now um, for um, unique funding opportunities. This is the Paid Family Leave Small Business Grant. This is for very, very small companies that have been impacted by paid family leaves expansion. So they can, you know, the employee is available to take leave. Uh, and uh, businesses that weren't formally subjected to the requirement, we can offer essentially uh, funding through the general fund. It's a $1 million funds it's intended to go directly to the small business themselves. So when an employee files for paid family leave, they can apply for a payment if they qualify, and that's 10 or fewer employees. We will essentially guide through two partners um, that have, receive the grant awardees for the total of the $1 million, they will receive, the small business themselves will receive a direct payment of 500 for each applicant of paid family leave. We have a website down at the bottom for grants, and that's for this. Um, we will be paying, making those payments uh, until the, the funds are exhausted. So that's paid family leave. It's a new program. It's a little sort of awkward to sort of introduce as a grant. Um, our, we have a second grant as well before I go to contact info. It's on the grant page. It's the um, it's the social uh, entrepreneurial program called Seed, and what Seed is doing it's actually uh, social entrepreneurs for economic development. This is a uh, ten million dollars of funding uh, that is going to be available for community based organizations that uh, that are working basically to address either social problems or community needs. They're supporting entrepreneurs working in this space. We're going to have informational webinars, and I'll post the additional information. And via Cal Recycle, we'll post this out. So for small businesses or CBOs working with uh, entrepreneurial skills, uh, we will have webinars on the February 2nd and February 4th. 
The deadline for applications for this $10 million is March 3rd. So if you know anybody serving entrepreneurs who might want more information, that link at the bottom here on this screen, etp.ca.gov for grants, will actually provide the uh, necessary information for you to look at it, see the uh, SFP uh, that will be out for release. We'll provide technical information on that and technical assistance once the awards are made and the contracts are up and running. Again, that's for entrepreneurial skills training, supporting small business. The other grant we have is here is paid family leave, uh, and that's to help small businesses impacted by the expansion of paid family leave. Lastly, sorry, this is a lot of contact information content. Um, this is our staff statewide and my team, uh, Renee Pierce in Northern California and the Bay Area. Uh, Southern California, uh, essentially at Kern South, uh, is Elsa Wadzinski. Um, the, both are very experienced in working with the program, providing overview information, connecting the details and helping uh, potential contractors and partners really understand the program in a way that they can move forward effectively. Um, I'm, I laugh when I say that I manage them. We work closely together uh, and, and you know share the ETP experience with uh, interested contractors. So if you have any questions, that's probably the best place for you to start. Um, and I will go ahead and go back from sharing my screen. Okay, I think I'm done with the screen yeah, and I'm available for any questions. Okay, Robert, thank you so much. This is Frank. It, you know, you did such a good job with this presentation. We're super excited that you, that we have two of the recycling manufacturers participating today who've taken part in the program and also that the, organization itself is so nimble that it can respond to COVID and natural disasters and so on. But we do have a couple of questions that we wanted to ask Sure. Uh, that came in. One is uh, from Robin Gemmel, and that person asks, are ROP programs eligible? Um, yes. Uh, the short answer is that uh, ROP programs are, are defined within our legislation as an eligible program. Uh, we have a couple statewide that have um, provided, you know, really uh, interesting career track programs. If you are working with an ROP, um, particularly one in serving an economically disadvantaged area um, or that has a good partnership with employers in their region and they're channeled uh, for recruitment, be glad to take a good look and, and see if there's a, a funding opportunity for them. Okay, thank you. I've got one other question from mm -hmm. you. It's from Nicole Ty, and she said, can we apply for funding for training people we don't employ, but are employed by other companies? We often get requests to provide training, but do not have the funding to develop this on our own. Um, you know, that if the, if the organization is set up as a school to provide training, and let's say accredited by the Bureau for Private Post-Secondary, I would say yes. If not, there might be a way that we could partner the training under an ETP contract with an eligible contractor. So I would just urge you to reach out to either uh, Renee or Elsa or myself and be glad to follow up with you and see if that's a, you know, that's a good match. Did I lose you? We're just having uh, coordination issues here. <laughs> you, it's only it's only a webinar with nineteen different partners and presentations and slides. Nothing oh, yeah. go wrong. Exactly, but luckily you guys are we doing have, a great job, though. Thank you, it, Robert. We have uh, you and other other people who are so skilled at doing this and help <laughs> us make pull this event off. Yeah, so that's how much you that. Yeah, I'm glad so to participate. We appreciate it very much. Next, uh, we've got Bob back on the line. And so we'd like to welcome him and our planet. And Bob, are you ready to begin the presentation? Can you hear me OK? I hear you perfectly. Perfect. OK, then then we're ready. My it's all yours. For the, uh, <laughs> for the technical difficulties here. Thanks, Rick. Uh, we have them here, too. All right. Um, well, I can certainly vouch for the ETP program. We've taken advantage of that one, and it's a fantastic program. Um, I'd encourage anybody who's eligible to uh, 
receive those funds to do so. And now I'll kick off my presentation. Uh, I think as uh, some of you know, we are a uh, manufacturer of rigid packaging and other products. Um, and what makes us very unique is the fact that we actually recycle post-consumer PET in order to make those products. And we do it all in our plant in Vernon, California. And I'll kind of hit some of the highlights of, of the company and you know what we're up to. Um, so in terms of the vision of the company, and this goes back to when um, we were just putting it together uh, many years ago, eight years or so ago, we really wanted to tackle the issues of plastic waste on, uh, on, on Earth, on the planet. And so we have established a company that does exactly that. Um, we also are working hard to be the leader in creating a truly sustainable closed loop system. And we have done that um, within our four walls. And then our business, uh, we do develop unique packaging solutions for our customers um, with an extremely low carbon footprint. A little bit about the company history, sustainability. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we do produce very high quality packaging and other products. Um, we do produce uh, to a bottle grade spec, which means it can go right back into any uh, beverage container. Obviously, you've got to have very high quality um, material that hits the FDA's requirements of direct food contact. And actually, we built our plant so we can hit higher specs than the FDA. The number of brands have higher specs than the FDA's, and we can hit all the brand specs that are out there. Over time, we plan to build four or five more of these facilities across the U.S. to provide a reliable and high-quality supply of post-consumer packaging and other products um, across the country from coast to coast. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the first plant's located in Vernon. Um, we're building the plant in two different phases in terms of putting the equipment in. The structure itself is already built. And for the plant itself, we have the first line in, which is recycling all the way through finished products. And we're going to put a second parallel line in as well, um, which at that point will double our production capacity and make it the largest plant by volume for the production of recycled PET or our pet for shorthand. In terms of our business model, I touched on this already. Um, currently, or I should say previously, uh, the operations that we do under our roof were done in three or four different facilities. Uh, the post-consumer bales would come in collected in, in the MERPs or through the deposit program here in the state. They go into one facility where the material could be sorted, ground, and, and washed. We go to another one where it's decontaminated and pelletized. Uh, decontamination, that, that's purifying it. That's removing any impurities in there. Um, in order to get to the FDA spec or higher. And then that material could go to another plant where actually uh, sheet or preforms are made. And then from there, it would move on to another plant where actually that sheet could be um, pressed into thermoform containers like strawberry containers, for example, the clear, pla clear plastic PET strawberry containers or in, into bottles where they then be filled, capped and labeled and so forth. Um, in our plant, we're doing everything from sort grind wash all the way through producing um, finished or semi-finished in the case of preforms. Preforms go through one more step. They get blown out into bottles. Um, we do not do that. Um, it's not very efficient to move around empty bottles. You're only moving air at that point and very little plastic. Preforms are much more efficient to move around. Um, the benefits though of the structure that we put in place is we do eliminate interme intermediate supplier markup so it's a more efficient and cost effective um, way to create uh, high RPET or percent RPET content products. Um, obviously we eliminate intermediate transportation costs between different plants that takes a lot of carbon footprint and cost out. Um, and then also the way that we set up our production process we're able to remove some costly production steps um, such as creating a pellet. Virgin PT comes in pellet form a lot of equipment out in the market it has to run on, on pellets um, or a high percentage of pellets, the equipment that we bought, it, it's state-of-the-art cutting edge and it actually allows us to run flake and it's just more, more efficient it, um, and it also provides a higher quality product. Um, I'll just spend a couple seconds on this slide. Um, we are uh, unique in many ways. Uh, for example, the, the Husky injection molders, that's what makes the preforms. 
The preforms are, um, if you can see, there's something that looks like a chest tube, but with the uh, it's just support wedge, as they call it, the ring, and then the, the, the screw top. Um, that's that's what a preform is. That gets blown out in the bottles. And so the injection molding machines that we purchased from Husky, they allow us to run recycled flake and the extent customers also request virgin pellet. To do it very efficiently and effectively. We don't have to slow down production times. Um, slow the machine down. If you run a lot of flake in the traditional Husky machines that only have a single screw versus the dual screws that we have, you have to slow the machine down, which makes it uh, less efficient, less effective, producing less parts per hour, obviously higher carbon footprint and um, and, and less efficiency. Um, in terms of the Crohn's line, that's where we actually recycle uh, the, uh, the post-consumer bottles, um, and that is... Uh, we have the only one um, in the Americas, so any, anywhere from you know Canada all the way on down through South America, the only Crohn's line in the world. Um, created some challenges for us to be finding qualified people to be able to operate the equipment, but we have done that. We've got a phenomenal staff. We've been able to assemble. In terms of the products that we manufacture, uh, we're just in the process of launching a 100% a recycled PET content drinking cup line we call it the enviro cup uh, we also have enviro um, pet sheet uh, which is uh, what gets pressed into thermoform containers and then we have our enviro pack line so a whole line of um, thermoform containers thermoform containers called thermoform because you use heat to press the sheet into a container so you use thermo heat and then you're forming different containers you don't melt the material but you do heat it up enough so you can actually press it into all the different shapes that you see on the screen there. Um, in terms of our, our preform capabilities, uh, you can see this preform and then uh, what a bottle would look like that gets blown out from it. Um, a lot of benefits that I already touched on with our um, preform manufacturing uh, process. In particular, uh, the flake decontamination, so we get a very high quality and clarity. Um, when you look at our our bottles that have been blown out from preforms made from 100% recycled PET, there's none better on the market. They, nobody can touch it. They typically have a little gray or greenish or something to them or yellowish. Ours look phenomenal. Um, and that really goes back to the process that we employ. Obviously lower energy costs, which leads to a uh, lower carbon footprint. Um, as I mentioned, we have very efficient equipment, um, so we don't have any cycle time penalties for running uh, our pet flake. And then also melt filtration. That's very important. When you're dealing with recycled materials, quite often uh, you can get little flecks of aluminum that could slip through the process, even though we have a number of QC um, the stages all, all along the way through the production process, but stuff can still slip through. We have very, very fine filters as we melt the material before we actually injection mold it or create the sheet, which removes. Um, the impurities, you don't want a two hole bottle. You only want a one hole bottle, the one you can fill it and drink out of the second hole and, and you've got a big problem. Uh, one of the unique things about us um, is we also um, are very much involved in the recycling of thermoform, post-consumer pet thermoform containers, um, and then giving them uh, another life in thermoform containers uh, for second, third, fourth time. Um, it's really unique that we're doing this. Uh, there's a lot of interest um, by a number of brands in the, in the produce and other sectors in order to um, have this material. Um, clearly now, unfortunately, we know in California, there's probably 200 odd million pounds of this material, uh, post-consumer pet thermoforms, and the vast majority of it, unfortunately, ends up going to landfill. Um, we are working hard to change this, um, and we certainly hope that we're successful. I know Cal Recycle um, would be uh, very happy to see us, uh, you know, change the dynamic as well. Um, one thing that, that's unique about us as well um, is that we have a third party certification. So it certifies that we are, when we tell a customer you've got 100% post consumer content in your product that we're delivering to you, we in fact do have 100% post-consumer um, content. So this is very important um, for us. We actually just got this in December and um, it's something that a number of our customers also were asking for. Uh, I won't spend too much time on this. I did mention though our plan is completely vertically integrated. So it's the only one of its kind in the world. So anybody who's on this webinar who would like to visit the 
facility, please reach out to me. We'd be glad to set up a tour. Um, but it's very efficient, um, very effective uh, process, which allows us to create um, really best in class products. Um, I mentioned carbon footprint before. Uh, also, uh, our process leads to the lowest carbon footprint products out there um, made from post consumer uh, pet. Um, generally speaking, uh, our 100% our pet uh, products have a carbon footprint that is roughly 60, 60% less than products made from virgin PET, so from fossil fuels, oil, natural gas. And in terms of other 100% RPET products that may be out in the marketplace, our carbon footprint's about 20% lower because the efficiency of our plant versus what I showed earlier, typically there's a number of plants and a number of different production steps and some production steps we've been able to remove that folks still, still go through. Uh, there is an aerial of our building. That's the, uh, the office area. So the building is 302,000 square feet. It's on 15 acres. Um, it was custom built to meet our needs. We were very lucky. Uh, the city of Vernon actually had this site um, available. Uh, we had looked all over California trying to find a city that actually um, did produce its own electricity, and we were really lucky. We, we looked in Anaheim, a number of other areas, and uh, when this popped up, we, we jumped on it, needless to say. Uh, real quickly, this is uh, the plant, how it's laid out. It's very efficient, um, and it is north-south, and so at the very top, uh, that reddish area, that's where the post consumer bales come in. That's where we sort, grind, uh, and, and mix, homogenize that material. And then it goes through the wash line. That's the blue area from the wash line and, and quality control as well. Um, then from the wash line, it goes into our decontamination reactors, which purify the material, the material and also boost its IVs. Uh, essentially the molecular weight uh, makes it suitable for uh, applications where you generally can't use post-consumer without coming through this process. For example, we can put our material in, into carbonated beverages, soda and so forth, and the bottles have to be more, more rigid and more stiff, um, or into thermoform containers, uh, into some bakery applications, for example, where that needs to, the material needs to go into the freezer. Um, and obviously, if you don't have the proper IV, it, it can be brittle, it can break, and you can have issues. So we made sure that we can actually produce for uh, a number of the, uh, the higher value added um, applications out in the marketplace. Um, after we manufacture our products, they go into the warehouse and out of the warehouse and off, uh, off the property to our, uh, to our customers. Um, in terms of some of the funding programs and other programs we've been able to take advantage of, and, and we're very thankful um, that the state offers these, they really do make a difference for a company such as ours um, for choosing location, um, obviously being able to train people, being able to, to hire the staff in order to purchase the equipment. Um, it's really just a bunch of phenomenal programs that we were lucky enough to be able to, um, to get involved in and take advantage of. Um, GoBiz, you folks already heard about GoBiz, but that's a great program run out of the governor's office. Um, with GoBiz, we did receive some state income tax credits, um, but there are a lot of other um, uh, things that the uh, GoBiz um, offers to folks as well. Um, site selection, if you need permits, streamlining help, you name it, um, that, uh, that department um, can get involved. Uh, we took advantage of the uh, California Alternative Energy and Advanced Transportation Financing Authority, or, or CAPA for short. Um, this is really great. It, it gives uh, a sales tax exemption um, on equipment um, that we were purchasing and, and continue to purchase related directly to our manufacturing operations. Um, you know, this is, we put a, a very big investment in Vernon and um, having this um, exemption was, was very, very um, helpful uh, for us. It, it really allowed us to save, save a lot of money and, you know, then put that towards, um, buying additional equipment and also um, obviously you know hiring and, and getting a, a best in class staff on board um, being able to you know pay pay the folks what we need to be able to pay them um, because the money is available um, that we didn't have to allocate to equipment expenditures um, the employment training panel we just heard about that um, we did take advantage of uh, the etp um, and we received several hundred thousand dollars towards the training of our folks, which we're very 
thankful for. And then for Cal Recycle, number of programs we took advantage of um, through Cal Recycle. The first was the RMDZ loan, um, and that helped us purchase uh, some equipment related to the uh, recycling portion of our business. Um, we also uh, were able to get uh, GHG uh, reduction loans, and that was those money specifically were used on equipment um, that we're using to be able to process and produce um, thermoform packaging using post-consumer thermoform material. Um, so that's another, and it's 4% 4, 4 for, for 10 years, and so it's a very attractive interest rate. Um, even in this low rate environment, I can tell you being a, a startup company, um, when, lenders are looking for a lot more than 4%. So the fact that we were able to get 4% money from Cal Recycle, we're very thankful for that. And then there's also um, the GHG reduction grants. Um, we were fortunate enough to get a $3 million grant um, through Cal Recycle, and those monies were used as well towards our efforts to um, recycle and produce thermoform uh, packaging and other products using post-consumer thermoform material. Uh, quick aside, we did actually produce um, some products using 100% post-consumer thermoform material. As far as we know, we're the only ones that can do that because we have the decontamination reactors that allow us to not only purify that material, but also to raise it, its IV to make it a higher quality material. And it gives it way better color and clarity um, characteristics. And we actually showed it to a, uh, to a customer, the 100% post-consumer thermoform container. And they compared it to the current containers that don't contain any post-consumer thermoform that they're receiving. And they said, this looks way better than what our current provider is, uh, is delivering to us. And so uh, it was really a testament to the hard work for, for my team um, to be able to develop the processes and the ability to be able to go and, and create packaging that is super high quality using post-consumer thermoform material. Uh, that was all that I had. Um, for this morning. I don't know if there are any questions. Thank you so much, Bob. I find it truly fascinating to see how products that we all likely use are made, and even better, how that's accomplished um, within a sustainable closed loop system. I also appreciate that you shared how the different funding um, programs or incentives that our planet Earth took advantage of, how that was of benefit, um, what you particularly used that funding for. That was really, really helpful. Thank you. And I will say there were a couple of questions that came in through the chat, if you will, or the questions in the webinar platform. And you answered, Bob, all the questions through your presentation. So that was fantastic. All right. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Right. Thank you again. <laughs> you're you're very that, welcome. Oh, thank you. With that, we're going to continue in our, our agenda here. The California State Treasurer's California Pollution Control Financing Administration, or CPCFA, partners with sister agencies to achieve the state's environmental policy direct objectives by administering high impact fi financing programs designed to assist regulated entities and other stakeholders with assessing private capital. We are fortunate to hear about these programs from Nancy Robles, CPCFA Executive Director. With that, please help me welcome Nancy. Hi there. Thanks, Marshall. Can you uh, see my screen and is it full screen? I don't think it's full screen because I see your next slide note. So maybe presentation mode. Yes. Let me correct that. So could it be um, the icon that's on the bottom of the white page with the little, go to the left, with your, go to the right, a little bit, what right there, 
It might that, not be. I believe that. Oh, that's, yeah. Okay. Well, so, piddle. Let me Sorry see. about that. Here we go. Let's try again. Okay, so see, there's a little icon. Oh. Is it still blank? No, it, it just didn't switch over to. Um, hmm. I see that it's engaged there. Right. So oh, see, it says resume slideshow to the left of your bank. I'll go all the way to the left in your blue screen, your desktop. Hmm. All the way off, do you see where your other icons are on your desktop? Or are you yeah. only seeing? Seeing it, yeah. There you go. And then that, I that icon came up again. Yeah, there you go. It did, but it's still not. Uh... Still not showing the whole thing. That's odd. Let me. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. Yes, thank you. <laughs> How's that working? Is that working at all? You know, we can see the presentation fine. We can just also see the other slides. Can you, there you go. Can you make it no, full fine. screen? Let's or see. full screen like up at the top um, where you can make your screen go all the way up to the far right. Yeah, Not yeah. the X, but the expanded box. Not that one, but to the left, right? Try that one. There we go. Now try. It still doesn't want to. I know it doesn't. That's odd. Resume. Well, let's huh. see. If it's well, you know it. what? This is just I'm fine. Not dancing either. So Nancy, we, yeah. we can see your presentation okay. just fine. It's not bad that we can see the slide deck on the side. It doesn't take anything away. <laughs> okay, hold on just a sec. Unless you have a lot of fancy. <laughs> No, I don't, which is, which is, which is good. Okay. Now try your, try that. No, I'm just thinking it might be on the wrong screen. No. Oh, uh, because you have two screens. Yeah. Okay. But that's fine the way it is. Um, All right. It was. Nope. It is this one. <laughs> All right. All right, we're just going to move on then. Thank you. So you thanks bet. so much, Marshall. I really uh, appreciate Cal Recycle and the fact that you're, um, you know, putting this presentation on for all of us. My name is Nancy Robles, and I am the executive director of the California Pollution Control Financing Authority, uh, affectionately known as CPCFA. You can always tell when you have a state agency because the uh, the name is always a huge mouthful, and uh, that's why we use the acronyms. So uh, California Pollution Control Financing Authority is uh, one of the financing authorities of the state treasurer's office. We um, have a good number of financing authorities, but I'm gonna talk to you uh, about two different ones today. And um, the uh, California Pollution Control Financing Authority has been around since 1972. So next year, we'll be celebrating our 50-year anniversary, which just blows me away that we've been around for 50 years. And for 50 years, the objective uh, of our organization is to help California prosper and also become more environmentally clean. So when anyone asks me, so what do you do? Um, at CPCFA, I give them my little elevator speech and I say, hey, we do three things basically. Although you'll see uh, later on that we actually do so much more. But number one, we issue tax exempt bonds. And then we also have a, uh, we provide grants and loans for funding for assessment and remediation of brownfield infill sites. And we have a small business finance center in which we provide capital access to small businesses. 
I'll also talk today uh, about another state treasurer's office agency financing authority called CAFA. And uh, we just heard from our clean, uh, our clean planet, and uh, they were mentioning CAFA that they received some benefit from that uh, agency. And, and so we'll hear that. It seems to be a reoccurring theme that I really appreciate here that we all seem to be working collectively together and that organizations can stack all of these different opportunities together. So CAFA, the California Alternative Energy and Advanced Transportation Financing Authority, uh, was established to help reduce greenhouse gas, gas emissions and also increase uh, sustainability and renewable energy sources. And uh, when someone says, what does CAFA do? They do three things as well. They award sales and use tax exclusions. They provide financing for low cost energy efficiency retrofits. And they also support a PACE program. So I'll talk in detail about all of these different entities. Uh, and we'll go ahead and start with the sales and use tax exclusion that CAFA runs. Uh, this is a, a tax exclusion for manufacturers and those who are uh, purchasing machinery and equipment that uh, is meant to expand high-end manufacturing within California. It's a way to help keep businesses and manufacturers here and uh, just bolster that particular uh, industry. And CAFA has awarded $100 million in sales and use tax exclusion to manufacturers year after year. Um, this program, um, uh, I believe, started in 2010. And what it does is offer manufacturers of advanced transportation, alternative sources, advanced manufacturing and recycling feedstock manufacturers um, a break on their taxes when they are purchasing equipment that help build and run these manufacturing firms. We heard a good example earlier uh, from, uh, from our planet, and I have another example here. It's called Fairway Future. And Fairway Future, um, it opened a manufacturing facility in Hanford, and they are manufacturing, uh, they're researching, designing, and manufacturing a high-performance electric vehicle. And this manufacturing factory is going to create about 100 jobs in that community. So not only are they uh, putting out electric vehicles, which is going to become very, very important in California over the next few years, they're also creating jobs. Another program of CAPFA is called CHIEF. Here we go again, we love our acronyms. It's the California Hub for Energy Efficiency Financing. And within CHIEF, they have a, a several different pilot programs and also uh, a really successful program called REAL, uh, which is um, Residential Energy Efficiency Loan Program. And they just reached a really great milestone. They have a thousand, uh, reached a thousand loans in December. So now they have more than a thousand loans in this program. Some of the other statistics I have on this slide might be a little bit outdated. We haven't uh, done our annual uh, update yet, but about 54% of those loans are to borrowers that are in a low to medium income census tract. And 14% um, are in disadvantaged areas. The average interest rate on these loans is about 6.11. There are seven lenders that are participating in this program and over 440 contractors. So this program was authorized by the California Public Utilities Commission, the CPUC. And the purpose of the program is to allow uh, you know, residential borrowers to upgrade the energy efficiency on their existing buildings. It's a fantastic program. 
They also have a, a PACE program. And what PACE is, is a property assessed clean energy loss reserve. So PACE is where a property owner um, can go through a PACE designated uh, lender and uh, it's for loans to retrofit their homes. And uh, normally with those loans, the borrower doesn't have to put any money down and uh, that loan is repaid through their property tax bill. So this was really controversial. Um, this program has been around for seven years and when it was proposed um, a while back, um, it became controversial and we were worried that lenders wouldn't uh, want to make these type of loans. So in order to help move that program along, uh, CAFA put up a reserve fund and um, then all of the PACE uh, lenders were able to enroll those PACE loans that they made into the CAFA reserve fund. And that's to, that was to help reduce the risk and allow lenders um, uh, a little more comfort in, in making these loans. So the loans are for water efficiency, for clean energy home improvements, um, and also for electric vehicle infrastructure. So far, over 131 loans have been enrolled in that program, and those financings are valued at about $3 billion. And the most fantastic thing about this program is basically they were right. Um, the risk to those loans seem very low, and we evaluate that by the fact that not one claim has been put against that program so far. So now uh, we'll move on to the California um, Pollution Control Financing Programs. And um, uh, I said we do three things there. Um, uh, tax exempt bonds, a brownfield program, and also small business. Now it looks like my slides are repeating themselves. So, <laughs> um, or did it just become full screen for you guys? I'm not really sure quite what happened, but I think you can just continue. I don't right. know. There we go. I'm back. There we go. So um, I'll go ahead and talk about our uh, private activity bonds and our bond transactions first. Um, <clears throat> uh, one of the examples of a bond transaction would be blue line transfer. And blue line transfer is um, a, a collection facility. This is a small um, mom and pop uh, family owned business, but they've been in business since the early 1900s. It's um, out of uh, the city of um, uh, South San Francisco and San Mateo County. And uh, they've actually taken out a couple of bonds with us. And the one that I'm showing an example of here was about $22 million. And it was for uh, pollution control and environmental benefits. So this is the type of bond that we make. And this particular facility um, not only is a recycler of food scrap, it also has a, an uh, anaerobic digestion facility that creates CNG fueled uh, or CNG fuel, and they use that for their collection vehicles. Um, one of the uh, benefits that Blue Line received not only from the bond transaction that occurred was we also have a small business assistance fund. So for small businesses that come in for bonds, um, depending on the amount of the bond, they could also receive uh, basically a grant from us that helps with the cost of ins issuance or the fees. So Blue Line received almost $46,000. This was also combined with CAFA's sales and use tax exclusion. So you can see um, projects can use multiple financing authorities and the benefits from them. They received uh, an exclusion valued at about $416,000. 
Another example is Rialto Bioenergy. Uh, this was a $117 million green bond for a bioenergy facility. Uh, it was also a small business and they built a facility to accept over 700 tons of food waste and convert that into renewable energy. The electricity from that is sold to Southern California Edison and the renewable natural gas is sold to the Anaheim Public Utilities. It's a really interesting project. There's another interesting project um, that uh, is one of my favorites, but I'm not going to talk about it today because I don't want to steal Jerry's thunder. But Cal Plant, which is the presentation that's coming up next, um, is also a project that was done at CPCFA. And uh, when I first started at CPCFA back in um, 2009, that was one of the first projects that I worked on, and it had been going on for a good number of years. And then I left CPCFA for a while and came back. And sure enough, I come back and we're still working with Cal Plant. So they've come a long way and, it, and it's an exciting project that uh, you'll hear about next. Another program at CPCFA is our Cal Reuse Remediation Grant and Loan Program. Now this program um, has expended all of its funds so uh, right now we do not have any fund for the program, but we are, um, uh, you know, soliciting legislation so that we can get more money back into this program. We hope that it can come back up and running because it's a really important part of affordable housing right now. So what that program uh, did, and we do still have some of the loans out there, um, but we offer grants and also loans to help developers clean up contaminated sites. And once they cleaned up the contaminated site, they could build housing projects on there. And we did have a requirement that a percentage of the, afford of the housing had to be affordable housing. So we funded 30 projects, awarded over $55 million dollars and uh, 21 of those projects are completed already on both their remediation and their housing development. And we have about eight projects that are um, in various stages of development right now. And uh, an example of one of those projects is it's called COM22 in San Diego. And uh, you can see these before and after pictures. And what the program is meant to do is take uh, areas of blight and turn them into housing and communities. So this particular one was a new housing community and there were 130 units built for families. And um, uh, the it included 197 units of affordable housing. It was also, it also had a lot of other amenities like a childcare facility, um, office space, uh, retail space, um, and it had a great impact on the community and it will for the next 30 years. This was an economically distressed area and um, it's become, uh, you know, just a, a really nice vibrant community. In our small business programs, we have a variety of small business programs. So I'll start with our CalCap small business. Uh, the CalCap small business program is the oldest program uh, for small business that we have at the uh, treasurer's office. And it includes a variety of different um, uh, a different funding. It's for working capital. It could be for a startup. Uh, it could be businesses expanding. Um, a few years back, uh, I, I heard somebody earlier talk about being continuously appropriated, which means we don't receive any money from the state. All of these programs are funded through our own monies. So uh, I said we've been around for 50 years, and a long time ago when we were issuing our bonds, uh, we took all of the fees for issuing the bonds and we just kind of set it aside. And then um, uh, 
there was an opportunity within the governor's office. They said, you know, we need to start this small business program. And does anybody have any money out there? So the treasurer's office took advantage of that and said, yeah, we have some money that we can put towards small business. So we took that bond fund and started up the CalCap for small business. Then um, in uh, 2011, uh, the small, uh, it's called the SSBCI, this uh, small business credit initiative, the federal government gave California $168 million, which was allowed us to continue the CalCap program. And not only that, develop other programs like the collateral support program. Back in 2009, um, you know, I, I, I say the Great Recession, but it will confuse people because it was the Great Recession of 2009, not the one we're experiencing right now. But during that time, values really dropped um, in real estate. So we were looking for a way where small businesses could still use um, their uh, business as collateral. Um, but lenders weren't making loans to them because the value had dropped so much. So we stepped in and said, okay, we'll back that up with some cash and developed the collateral support program. We also um, have interagency agreements with different state entities. And our uh, CalCap Air Resources Board Truck Loan Assistance Program, we partnered with the Air Resources Board I'll talk a little bit more about each of these um, in a moment. Our CalCap electric vehicle charging station program is a contract with the California Energy Commission with CEC. We also have an American and uh, the ADA Act, Americans with Disabilities Act financing program where we help businesses um, get their buildings into ADA accessibility um, uh, uh, with retrofits and they um, we help them get into compliance. Also a seismic safety loan program where small businesses and building owners can upgrade for seismic safety compliance. So for the CalCap small business, um, it was really interesting when I first came to CPCFA um, I, uh, I'm a recovering banker, so I came from the private banking industry. And when I heard about this program, I was so shocked. 30 years in the banking industry, and I had never heard of the CalCap for Small Business program. And all I could think was, oh my gosh, if some of the banks that I had worked for had known about this program, they might still be in business today. Because this program assists lenders um, against the risk of making loans to small businesses. So this, what this does is it allows a small business who can't get a loan, let's say at Bank of America or Wells Fargo, um, if they don't qualify for loans there or even through SBA, they can turn to the CalCap for Small Business program. And we incentivize lenders to make loans to those small businesses and we offset the risk by putting monies aside into a loan loss reserve account for them. Now, earlier we heard uh, Bruce talking about uh, a loan program that they had for um, recycling that went up to $2 million. So this is a good example of a program that can, that can help if you have a recycling uh, center that's or if you need, you have needs for funds more than $2 million, this particular loan program goes up to $5 million. So this is ways that we can help each other as state agencies. We fill the gaps. And if you have a, a need for more than $5 million, then you can turn to the bond program, which can be a much larger, or the collateral support program. So the small business programs, it, it's for land acquisition, working capital, construction, equipment, um, food trucks. We It was uh, really interesting. We had a huge run on food trucks when it was very popular and, uh, and had just an enormous number of food trucks. And I can remember going to um, 
uh, going to a conference in Dallas, Texas, where we had made a loan for a, a food truck company in Oakland. And they had become so big and expanded so much as a result of that first loan that we gave them that they had expanded nationwide. So it was really exciting to see that. In our collateral support program, um, we offer an additional incentive, incentive if uh, that collateral support is supporting green or uh, manufacturing loans. Um, also in our small business program, if it's in a if the business is in a severely affected community, we have additional incentives for them as well. The electric vehicle charging station program uh, is one that I'm very excited about with, you know, the new uh, mandates for electric vehicles. We're going to need electric vehicle charging stations. So this is an incentive that helps um, not only businesses put charging stations at their business, but also uh, multi-unit uh, dwellings. So an apartment complex that might want to install some uh, electric vehicle charging stations as another incentive to people to come rent there can borrow from us. And uh, we have uh, also a rebate. There's a rebate available on this um, for loans that uh, are, are paid well either to maturity or within the first 48 months. The American Disabilities Act financing program is to assist businesses with um, you know, uh, surveying their facilities for uh, estimating and planning. And uh, it, it isn't for building expansion, it's actually for existing buildings that just need to be brought up to code. Seismic safety, this is for retrofitting of buildings and also multi-unit housing where um, if uh, um, a building needs to be retrofit to protect from earthquake damage, again, it has to be an existing building, we're able to provide funding for that. So an interagency agreement that we have with the Air Resources Board is for a truck loan assistance program. And what this program does is it takes the uh, dirtier running emission vehicles off the road and it helps these um, small business owners with fleets of 10 or less purchase newer vehicles. And um, we've particularly targeted the smaller uh, business owners to be helpful with them to be able to afford these new vehicles. So it's companies with 100 employees or less and that makes less than 100 million over an average of three years. We don't have any um, uh, minimum loan amount on this and the terms are very flexible. And um, these are for 2010 or newer engine models. And it's uh, it, it can be diesel if it's the newer, cleaner diesel fuel also compressed natural gas or CNG and liquefied natural natural gas, LNG. We can also do electric vehicles and we are, you know, we're getting ready to push for zero emission technology. So zero emission vehicles are also qualified in this particular program. Um, this has been a very successful program and ARB has been a fantastic partner here. In 2020 alone, even with the pandemic, we financed 4,410 vehicles. And that number was almost equal to the prior year and the prior year to that. So that's 4,600 trucks that um, are newer and cleaner out on the road. And since this program began in 2009, there we financed almost 31,000 newer trucks. So super exciting program. I'm really excited to see what we can do in the zero emission uh, portion of that. And uh, there's contact information there. If uh, anyone needs to contact us, you can reach out to me directly 
or that phone line on the bottom and also follow us on Twitter. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Nancy. Thank you. I appreciate you sharing these uh, multiple programs and incentives to support a green economy, specifically those for recycling manufacturing. I also appreciate how you highlighted how a business can leverage multiple programs. And already just from your presentation and those from our other speakers, you can see why businesses need assistance in navigating all these different programs. Um, the programs luckily don't stay constant, that they're responsive to change. And we've heard a lot of that relative to um, disasters and COVID. So I, I really appreciate, um, again, we've heard it throughout, the, the partnership among sister agencies throughout the state. So at this point, I'd like to see if we have any questions come in for Nancy. Doesn't look like it. That's because you did such a good job. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. And I'll just, as a reminder, let you know that we will continue to um, monitor the questions and comments coming in and make sure that everybody uh, gets a response. It just may not happen today. Now, we have another ex excellent example of recycling manufacturing and the programs that we've heard about in action. Cal Plant One, a Northern California based company focused on manufacturing sustainably sourced building products, recently launched a rice straw based medium density fiber board, or MFD, called Eureka. Eureka is manufactured using post-harvest rice straw, an agricultural waste product. Today, here to share Cal Plant's success story is Jerry Wooland, founder and CEO of Cal Plant One. Please help me welcome Jerry. Thank you, Marshall. You have my screen? Yep. I can hear you perfectly and your screen looks great. Okay, it kind of feels like an old home week here today. Um, I began working with the state treasurer's office in 2000 and CPCFA at that same time. And then once we were under construction in uh, 2017, I began working with Ponum at uh, uh, GoBiz and then uh, Robert at ETP. And, and uh, now recently I started working with uh, Chico State University and assisting them uh, with a Cal Recycle grant to use uh, our waste straw and and the waste twine from the bales to make uh, uh, additional consumer products. So uh, attendees on this call um, with ideas or projects um, uh, and looking for funding. This is a, a fantastic a playbook and uh, quite a, quite a, a forum to have assembled all these different programs that can assist in the financing of those ideas and projects. So uh, hats off to all the, the agencies that, that joined this thing in Cal Recycle for, for jumping in and championing this. Um, I'll, uh, I'll run through my presentation fairly quickly, but I'd make myself available to any of the, the attendees that want a one-on-one -on -one that might help them with their ideas. Because I'm uh, I guess the uh, oldest running project at CPCFA, uh, not, a, not an award you want to pin on your, on your wall. Uh, it took us a long time to, to pull this project together. And when you're building the world's very first rice straw based medium density fiber board, and you're dealing with project finance, which you'll hear a little bit more here in a minute, uh, you'll understand some of the, the trials and tribulations that we experienced, but uh, never gave up along that uh, long journey. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the financing pieces, uh, some additional things as you've heard today so far after construction began in 2017. And then I'll just do a, a last couple of slides that uh, talk a little bit about, uh, it wasn't all uh, project finance related, some of the issues that we faced during that 20 year period. Um, and uh, that this will maybe help explain some of the, the obstacles we had to overcome. Um, we, we exist, and I say we, Cal Plant exists because of the California Air Resources Board uh, banning the burning of rice straw after the annual harvest. 
uh, rice was first planted in California in 1912. And uh, pretty much ever since then, until these laws were enacted in 1991, we had burned the straw after the annual harvest. Uh, I was a grower for 25 years, uh, became uh, very used to that practice. It was very inexpensive, cost me about $1 per acre to, to, to manage my post-harvest straw. And then um, uh, the Air Resources Board changed the way we were going to do business in California. In California. Uh, we didn't know what we were going to do as a, as a growing group. Um, my brother and all thought we would go bankrupt if we didn't have the tools for burning. And uh, uh, at 80 years old, one of my largest rice buyers, Jim Boyd, approached me as he was retiring from the business and asked if uh, I would uh, join him in looking at turning a lemonade, lemons into lemonade. Uh, he actually said, what, do you, what would you like to do with the straw? And I said, uh, let's keep fighting. Uh, don't give up now, Jim. And he's, he's the guy that uh, said, well, let's turn this into, into something positive. So it was his, um, uh, I guess, constant challenge of me saying, come on, let's do something here that uh, drove me into this, this area. When I, when I traveled the world originally back in uh, 1996, when I sent the first straw to England, um, folks go, they grow rice in California. So I usually start a, a presentation with this, and there's probably everybody in, on this call most likely knows that we grow rice in California, but maybe not know why we do. Uh, it's grown on a, a type of soil that, for the most part, no other crop can be grown. It's a six to eight inch growing medium. The soil is a very heavy uh, adobe clay pan underneath that growing medium, and it holds water ex extremely well. I use the, uh, the bathtub as an example for why we grow rice in, in, in this soil in California. We grow medium grain rice and the other five growing states, Arkansas being the largest, the 1.3 million acres, uh, typically grow a, a long grain and compete with a lot of the other uh, countries. Uh, we grow this medium grain, which um, is consumed about 50% by, by US domestic uses and the, the rest of it's exported but it's a very high yielder in straw. We get about five tons of rice straw per acre and the straw to grain ratio is about one to one. So our state average is approaching 100 uh, uh, sacks or uh, five tons of edible grain per acre. And we are also seeing that same equivalent uh, in, in rice straw. Now we go out after the annual harvest and bale this material. Uh, and bring it onto our big 300 acre plant site. Uh, but we're only able to collect somewhere between two and a half to three tons just because of uh, some of the biomass that's not, not able to be collected and put into a bale. Uh, but why did it take us uh, the, the 20 years, eight months and 17 days? And um, uh, the clear, clear answer for me from the very beginning was this project finance concept. That particular path, uh, non-recourse debt, where lenders and, and investors look solely at the four corners of the contracts because the developer, old Jer here, didn't have a balance sheet uh, big enough to, uh, to backstop uh, a $350, $400 million project. So uh, what you have to do as far as uh, uh, contract wise is get some supplier of equipment to guarantee that the plant will produce X volume at, at a certain minimum quality and so consuming no more than X in its uh, raw materials, uh, providing uh, the minimum amount of pollution and on and on. Uh, and all of this associated with liquidated damages. So that company has to be very well healed, very established in the industry and, um, and willing to take that kind of risk. Uh, so they're putting their reputation, their company's reputation at risk if there is a failure. Um, I would happen to end up working with Simple Camp out of Germany. And, uh, and that company at the time was a 130 year old privately held German company, uh, very risk averse, but it had a 60, 65% global market share for supplying equipment that I needed for making medium density fiberboard. And there was only one other company in the world that existed at the time for doing that same thing, also located in Germany. Uh, but they were the smaller guy and I wanted I wanted that big balance sheet to help this project. So it took uh, three years uh, to get them to provide the kind of contract that was financeable. 
uh, during a lot of my R&D time, I made board, brought it back to the States, and then had end users use that board. And uh, no one, don't believe it for a minute, if anyone says build it, they will come, because uh, no one's going to invest in a project like that. Uh, they're looking for contracts. So the term of my dad is 22 years. Um, I had to have a contract that guaranteed the sale of this product for the next 22 years. And it took about five years just to get that one. Um, an additional component to that offtake agreement is the fact that the offtaker was providing a, a minimum floor price guarantee. So uh, if the markets were to go upside down, that particular company would uh, provide a, a minimum guaranteed price to help uh, provide debt service. Also on the, is the long-term offtakes. So I had to have rice straw guaranteed at a fixed price for the next 22 years and other raw materials like glue. So these projects take a long time to put together contracts that are financeable at the end of the day. They also increase the risk. So it makes it harder to finance because when you start adding all these layers of risk, you're not getting it for free. Um, and then it starts to eat away at the return on investment for the equity investors. Uh, so it's uh, they're difficult to put together. And uh, uh, I'm certainly happy to, to, to talk somebody either off a ledge or uh, into this kind of financing if uh, it would like to talk afterwards. So we began our journey, um, sent the first rice straw to the UK in 1996 and had a wonderful failure. Uh, we learned that you can't make particle board out of rice straw because rice straw is an aquatic plant made of a high quality wax. So that high quality wax repels water. Well, it also repelled the glue that I was trying to add to the straw to make a board. So um, I worked uh, then in a, at a, at a one-stop shop pilot plant in uh, Bangor, Wales in 1997, where I had the first success making a uh, medium density fiber board. Um, <clears throat> at that time, I began working with uh, Metso after I be believed I had uh, a process that was repeatable and very robust. I approached them in 2000 because they were the world's largest equipment supply company with about a $9 billion balance sheet to help um, provide the kinds of contracts that this project would need. And uh, it took uh, six years because what they wanted to do was test every piece of equipment within the process and understand not how to make just good board, but what happens when the train goes off the tracks. And so we had to uh, crash the, the process in every application and how quickly can we bring it back online. So those are some of the things that we experienced during that R&D period. Uh, the financing pieces that uh, we used to get uh, the project constructed here in, in uh, now finally uh, near operating was uh, the CPCFA, as you heard from Nancy today. We used the tax and bond program. Um, I first, uh, put an application in for that 2000 for initial resolution where they qualified the the project to qualify for the tax exempt portion of this um, this rice straw could have been bailed and headed towards a landfill so rather than doing that we diverted it into this manufacturing process and that's how we qualified for cpcfa financing um, the people that that, are, that make up i guess the bond investor group um, our, your, your traditional big uh, institutional investors, uh, BlackRock, Vanguard, Franklin Templeton, Citigroup, and uh, presenting to them uh, has its challenges. Of course, they have uh, a project finance group, which is the one that we always approached, and uh, th those are the ones making the rules. And so that's why the project finance model is uh, so, so, I guess, uh, uh, restrictive, if you will, in that uh, if you don't have the pieces and they can't check the boxes, then you're you're really not ever going to get your project financed unless you're using some other kind of uh, capital. Uh, the next was the equity. So there's this chicken and egg thing that we had to balance. Uh, the equity doesn't want to come in if they don't know there's debt around and the debt doesn't want to come in unless they know there's equity there. So you're, you're running down two paths at the same time. And uh, uh, for the for the first 20 years, uh, I used and I don't, I don't say used. I I uh, had, if you bet, for lack of a better term, um, the fortune to, fortunate enough to have friends and family who believed in the idea, 
and uh, put the mass together of 101 uh, investors. Now these are friends and family and uncles and aunts and a uh, brother and a sister who still talk to me. And we, uh, well, as my wife would say, I divested every penny we'd ever made at the time, but um, uh, you believe in something and you, and you, you give it your all. And so um, we used that 25 million during that 20 plus year period to get a patent, to do preliminary engineering, to get these contracts, as you heard, they, they take a long time to get and uh, do your permitting and get things ready for that financing day. Um, the, the capital required for this project was initially 315 million. We had 225 million from a CPCFA tax exempt bond program and another 90 million from uh, equity investors. And they're, they're made up of uh, four of the uh, uh, large institutions that you, you might wanna visit and put you in contact with them. So after we started construction, we continued on and looked at ways to continue to help uh, this project be successful at the end of the day. So the Kate for one, as you can see here, we were approved $7.8 million in sales tax exclusion. So that really helped uh, our success during that construction period because um, believe me, everything you think that you could think of in order to get a construction project done, there are hundreds of things you've forgotten and uh, and these things cost more and take longer to develop than you could ever have imagined. Uh, then as we uh, got closer to startup, we started working with Robert and ETP. And in that program, we received uh, 290,000 of, of, uh, of an award there. Now our training, because we're building the world's very first, uh, we budgeted over $3.5 million. Uh, part of that is contracted with Simple Camp because they're going to be on site with us as we start the plant, as we have started the plant. We produced our first board in late November 2020, and uh, we're now we're making some uh, tweaks to the process as, as is very common to these giant facilities. And we are uh, uh, making these uh, minor adjustments, but they stay on site with you, help train your employees so that once they leave, we know how to, to keep the plant operational. But uh, here's a quick overview of just uh, some of the things that we encountered during that uh, long trek. Uh, the first board trial, as I said, in 96. Um, 96 to 2007, all that time was trial work, make board, have end users use this board so that it does demonstrate the ability to perform as well or better than the wood-based boards they're currently using. And we get very close to a financing close. Morgan Stanley's our equity and we come into a debt crisis and the worldwide recession followed shortly thereafter. Uh, that group vanished in March, by March, 2008. At that same time, my equipment supply company providing the guarantees I had uh, so, so worked so hard to, to secure, uh, decided to sell its press and energy division to Simple Camp and get out of the business. Uh, so that's when I began working in Germany instead of Sweden and uh, convincing the Simple Camp group to uh, be that equipment supply contractor for the project. 2012 to 14, uh, get the contracts renewed. I knock on a bunch of doors. I raised another $90 million of equity at this time, um, which you sometimes find out the equity and uh, uh, changes the deal to at the very end. And our contract partners, as I, as I write here, uh, which are the equipment supply company, the off takers, the raw material suppliers, all said, we don't really want to work for these guys. And so they said no to the, the request to change the contracts. And uh, we, we started over again. 2015 took me about uh, 10 months to secure a, a commitment from TIAA, a very large house that's now uh, managing somewhere close to $1 trillion. So uh, there's a lot of groups, a lot of people, and the due diligence is very extensive. We get uh, verbal commitments from uh, institutional bond investors to purchase the bonds that we had been approved for way back in when. And um, about this time, uh, we have an election and $28 billion leave the bond market for quick money equities. 
what I mean there is that uh, the equities markets was red hot. So rather than keeping investors keeping their money in the safe haven bond market, uh, monies were being drawn out of those safe haven markets and put into equities where it's higher risk but higher reward. And so the bond institutions um, were feeling a little illiquid. And when we opened up the bond sale on, uh, on Pearl Harbor Day, uh, we only raised about half of our debt. So uh, we didn't close another financing. So that was attempt number three. And now we're here at attempt number four, February 2017. Citigroup, after a, a, a long, hard uh, winter, um, comes to California and uh, we meet at the plant site, the proposed plant site at the time. And um, we they jump in with a group and do due diligence. And we've been working with Stiefel Nicholas, which was at the time our placement agent for the bonds. And uh, bond investors are now saying, well, wow, City's here, and City's going to not only sell us the bonds, but they're also going to buy some bonds. So that really changed uh, the environment and the attitude for the bond investors. And we opened up our sale, uh, which we only had $225 million of worth of bonds to sell. Uh, we, we received orders for $834 million. So um, its timing sure was a good time for that to happen, but it, finally all the stars aligned. And we then later that month uh, allocated uh, the 225 to select bond investors um, that we knew would be uh, very pro project. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions anyone might have. Uh, there's my contact information and um, I'm happy to assist any way I can after this uh, webinar. Thank you so much, Jerry. It's extremely eye-opening to hear how an extensive, what an extensive project this is and how a number of the state's funding programs and incentives has been a part of that arduous journey as you have described it. It's also encouraging to think about the incredible impact this project has in terms of job opportunity and the local economy. With that, I think we have at least one question for Jerry. So I'm going to turn it over to Frank. OK, one question we have from Manuel Medrano, the president of the California Association of Recycling Market Developers Development Zones is, how will the product compare in price versus traditional MDF board? Because uh, that's a great question, and I get that asked by all investors and have for the last 15 years. Um, a rice straw it, uh, behaves when it's in its cellulosic form uh, identical to a wood-based uh, cellulose. So, from a from a product perspective, um, and because we have an aquatic plant here, we actually outperform the MDF. Uh, that's made that's traditionally made with uh, wood. Now I'm able to make this board uh, at less cost than wood-based boards because of the cost of wood fiber and my rice straw fiber uh, are quite different. I'm able to collect this straw and have it sitting in my yard for about sixty dollars a ton. Where in California, when the last plant was operating, and the, today there are no MDF plants in California because of a wood shortage. Uh, it was costing them about $120 a ton to get uh, that wood fiber into their yard. So we had that big uh, advantage with raw material. Uh, when you look at the other states, there's three MDF plants, including ours in the Western United States, uh, one in Oregon, one in Montana, and ours in California. Um, the Western U.S., which is defined as uh, uh, west of the Mississippi, uh, consumes about uh, one billion uh, uh, square feet of MDF. Uh, the, those first two plants, the one in Oregon produces about 100 million. Uh, the one in, in Montana produces about 300 million and our plant here will be 150. So we still have to import about uh, over 50% of the, the MDF that's used in the Western region. Um, and then California being the largest consumer in the Western region, we have a, a, a huge tr uh, transportation advantage over the over the two plants, and one in Oregon and one in Washington, in uh, Montana. So uh, the transportation advantage and the raw material advantage give us a a, a cost competitive edge. 
Uh, but of course, we're going to be selling the board for the same price that the wood guys are selling theirs for. Okay. Thank you so much, Jerry. The other question from Manuel is, will you have greenhouse gas savings re or a savings report or a life cycle analysis on the product? We, we will have. You know, what, what we have learned um, in, in rice cultivation, rice farming in California, that after we're losing the tool of burning and we migrated towards uh, chopping the straw, uh, subjecting the straw to soil through plowing and disking and then reflooding the fields during the, the, the winter months in order to rot the straw. So the straw is fully decomposed for us to plant rice on, it, on that same land or parcel the next year because uh, we don't rotate out. We, we plant rice on the same ground year after year. Um, we're now generating some methane gas. Um, so we're, so our hope here is to be able to measure that, quantify it um, in the in the carbon markets, but we are and have and have initiated the life cycle analysis and we'll have all the certifications for our product uh, once we're we're selling uh, on grade product into the marketplace. Okay, Jerry, thanks so much. Here's a question from Rob Thies. Is there potential to reuse this fiber board post-life? Can it be reclaimed and recycled back into your process? Another great question, and, and the answer is yes. In our process, we um, have the ability to, um, if, if a board did not make grade, we have a what's called a, a board breaker and a, and a hog. And that board breaker, uh, choose this uh, board and the panels we make are, are 10 foot wide by 18 foot long and then downstream within the process we chop them into four by eights, five by nines, five by tens, whatever happens to be the, the, the purchase dimension. But we chop these boards into um, let's just say a softball size, baseball size and then it enters the hog which then turns it into a 50 cent piece. That material then goes back over to the refining system which turns that board back into fiber. So we will be able to reclaim board uh, and put it right back into the to the process. We can do the same thing with our sander dust. After we sand the, the product to the specification of the end user, that sander dust goes back into another board. So we, uh, we're very proud of the fact we've developed a, a process, an MDF manufacturing process that uh, has uh, very, very little waste. And this is Marshall. I'm just going to add before we go to the next question, Plus, you're working on um, finding a market for your for your waste materials, right? We are with Chico State. Uh, uh, Dr. Joe Green has come up with some really unique ideas to use sander dust rather than putting it back into our board and uh, our waste twine and recycle that uh, that polypropylene into um, some post formable. Uh, interior car parts. So we're very excited to be working with uh, Joe and, and his team. Okay, I, the last question is, what learnings did you have on receiving pre-orders prior to having a plant? Were these MOUs? Th these were actually uh, binding contracts. So end users, uh, I would send board that I made either in uh, Sweden, Germany, or wherever uh, to, and I'll just drop a few names so you can understand where the products are used. I, I sent board to uh, Pergo in France so they could test this board as a substrate for laminate flooring. Uh, Bose Corporation was interested in a tree-free formaldehyde-free formaldehyde -free speaker cabinet. So I sent it to them and to uh, Souter Woodworking in Ohio uh, the third largest ready to assemble furniture manufacturer, office furniture manufacturer. I then sent this board to Columbia Forest Products. They have about a 50% um, uh, North American market share in hardwood plywood. Every time you go into Starbucks, all that beautiful veneer you're looking at, there's MDF on the inside of that. Uh, so what I did was look at some of the major end users and all the market segments where wood-based MDF is used, molding and millwork, for example, send it to pack trim. Uh, send it to uh, Sunset uh, Molding in Live Oak. I mean, some people right here in our, our valley set your forest products in Sacramento. 
and they all use the board to test the board to make sure that this product would behave and demonstrate uh, wood-like characteristics and it, and it has in all applications. But these are by binding contracts. Thank you again tremendously, Jerry, for your time and sharing your experience. Thanks, that, Marcia. That concludes our presentations for this morning. And I am just thrilled that we, um, let's see, we are a little bit early. It's 11.52. We're going to take a lunch break now, and we're going to come back at 12.30, and we're going to start at 12.30 promptly. And again, a number of people have asked about the presentations. So this webinar is being recorded, and it will be posted on our website, and we will send out a listserv notification, multiple listserv notifications, but for sure you can... Um, Join the SLCP. Is it organics? SLCP. At SLCP at calrecycle.ca.gov. We look forward to seeing you at 1230. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon and welcome back. We've already learned a lot this morning and we still have a lot more in store for you this afternoon. To get us started, California's Employment Development Department, or EDD, offers, excuse me, offers businesses a variety of services and programs at no cost designed to strengthen the economic vitality of Californians and their communities. Building on what we have already heard this morning with respect to the state's responsiveness to business needs relative to COVID and natural disasters, the next two presentations highlight invaluable business resources during these unprecedented times. First, I'd like to introduce Wendy Martinez and Corina Crittenden to share about EDD's Work Opportunity Tax Credit. Hi, um, good afternoon. This is Wendy Martinez and my co-worker, Karina Crittenden. Um, today, we're going to go ahead and play this presentation for you. It's about 12, 12 minutes long. Once the presentation is complete, if you have further questions about our program, we uh, will be here. We'll be more than welcome to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Work Opportunity Tax Credit training webinar. Thank you for taking the time to join us to learn about the Work Opportunity Tax Credit Program, known as WOTSI. We're glad to share it with you. My name is Rick Helmer, and I have with me Felicia Phillips and Leslie Glover from the WOTSI Program Team. Our objectives for today are first, to describe the WOTSI Program and explain how this program assists individuals and employers. Second, we will identify the WOTC target groups and tax credits that are available to employers when hiring individuals. Next, we will explain the application process for employers and the benefits of the online application method. And lastly, we will provide the WOTC contact information. So let's get started. Our first objective, what is the WOTC program? The Work Opportunity Tax Credit is a federal tax credit program available to employers for hiring individuals from traditionally hard-to-hire target groups, such as recipients receiving TANF, ex-felons, and veterans to name a few. The WATC program is available in all 50 states and two territories, which include Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. The WATC's administrative procedure involves Congress reauthorizing the program and its target groups every two years and its funding on an annual basis. In California, the Employment Development Department administers the processing of the WATC certification. 
The WATSI Authorization Center not only processes all the WATSI requests, but it also provides customer service and technical assistance. To better understand how the WATSI program puts Californians to work, here's some facts. The state of California receives and processes more WATSI requests than any other state or territory. After California, Texas and Florida are the second and third largest programs, respectively. Did you know that California processes an average of 400,000 WATSI applications each year? As a result, California issues an average of $550 million of potential tax credits each year. Now let's take a look at how WATSI helps California. WATSI encourages the hiring of individuals who face significant barriers to employment by providing a federal tax credit to employers who hire these individuals. WATSI helps boost California's economy by putting more of the population to work, therefore saving funds of supportive services like food stamps, unemployment, and others. Now that we have described the WATSI program and how it helps Californians, let's explore the second objective, which is identifying the WATSI target groups. Target groups are categories of individuals who are traditionally hard to hire. Let's take a look at the various target groups that the WATSI program assists. Currently, there are 10 target groups with tax credits ranging from $1,200 to $9,600. Those target groups are Group A, Short-Term Temporary Assistance for Needy Families or TANF recipients. Group B, Veterans, which has five subcategories. Group C, Ex-Felons. Group D, Designated Community Residents. Group E, Vocational Rehabilitation Referrals. Group F, Qualified Summer Youth. Group G, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, food stamp recipients. Group H, Supplemental Security Income, or SSI recipients. Group I, Long-Term TANF recipients. And finally, Group L, Qualified Long-Term Unemployment Insurance recipients. The definition of each target group and its qualifications are established by the U.S. Department of Labor, while at the state level, the Employment Development Department, as a state workforce agency, administers and provides WATSI program services for these target groups. Now that we have identified the 10 target groups, let's focus on the veterans target group. To honor our veterans, the WATSI program has developed a processing preference. The processing preference allows a veteran target group to have a priority of service over all the target groups as required by U.S. law. To be considered a qualified veteran applicant for the WATSI program, the individual must have served 180 days of consecutive active duty, not including training, or have been discharged or released from active duty for a service-connected disability, and not have a period of active duty, not including training, of more than 90 days that ended during the 60-day period ending on the hiring date. Additionally, qualified veterans include those who received any type of discharge from the U.S. military. And lastly, it is important to mention that there is no age restriction in this category. In the veterans target group, there are five sub-target groups. These include, one, a veteran who is a member of a family that receives SNAP benefits or food stamps. Two, a veteran with a service-connected disability who has been hired within one year of discharge from active duty, or three, a veteran who is unemployed for at least six months prior to being hired, four, a veteran who has been unemployed for at least four weeks, or five, a veteran who has been unemployed for at least six months prior to being hired. These are great incentives for employers to hire veterans. Employers can receive up to $9,600, which is the highest tax credit in the WATSI program.
Now that we have identified the 10 target groups and the priority of service for veterans, let's explain the application process for employers and the benefits of the online application method. When does the request need to be submitted? Applications for requests of certification must be submitted together by an employer or agent, either online or mailed and postmarked within 28 days of the employee's start date. If the employer or agent chooses the online method, the electronic application can be submitted at www.edd.ca.gov forward slash WOTC after completing a short one-time enrollment process. If the employer or agent chooses the mail method, the paper application can be sent to EDD WOTC Authorization Center at 2901 50th Street, Sacramento, California, 95817. Please note that the Work Opportunity Tax Credit Authorization Center does not accept fax or email applications. In August 2013, EYC was introduced offering several online services to employers and agents. Here is a screenshot of the EYC employer's homepage. As you can see, there are multiple functions and features that employers and agents can access. Now, let's take a look at the benefits of using EYC. Among the benefits, employers and agents are able to submit online YC certification request applications, check the status of submitted online and paper applications dating as far back as July 18, 2011, print determination letters for previously submitted applications, and enable faster application processing, which allows employers to receive a tax credit much sooner than in previous years. Currently, over 90% of all applications are submitted electronically. Next, let's discuss what forms are needed to apply. There are two forms that must be filled out and signed by both the employee and the employer to request certification. The first form is the Internal Revenue Service IRS 8850, which is the pre-screening notice and certification request and is required for all WACI applications. Second is the Employment and Training Administration ETA 9600, which is the individual characteristics form. It is also mandatory for all WACI applications. Occasionally, there may be a need for additional documentation to support an individual's eligibility. If the employer has any of the following supporting documents for the applicable target groups below, these could be submitted with the WOTC application. The acceptable supporting documents are, for veterans, the DD-214, or if applicable, a letter from the Veterans Administration stating the veteran's disability status. For vocational rehabilitation referrals, a letter verifying the referral from the Vocational Rehabilitation Agency, Social Services Agency, or Veterans Administration. For ex-felons, court documents, correctional institution records, or a statement from a parole officer. These documents should include the inmate identification number with their conviction and or release date. If filing by mail, the employer could submit supporting documents along with the paper WOTC application. If filing electronically, the employer should wait for a request from the WOTC office to submit supporting documentation. Once the WOTC application has been reviewed by the WOTC office, a letter of determination will be mailed to the employer or the tax representative. If the letter of determination is an approved certification, the next step for the employer or the tax representative will be to file the tax credit with the Internal Revenue Service. Additional processing information can be found on the IRS website. If the letter of determination is a denial, 
It will state the reason why it was denied. Now that we have covered the WATSI application process, let's move on to our last objective, which is how to contact the California WATSI office. There are various ways to contact the California Work Opportunity Tax Credit Authorization Center. You can choose from the following options. You can contact us via our website at www dot edd dot ca dot gov forward slash wtc also you may email us at watsi support at edd dot ca dot gov or call our toll free telephone number 1-866-593-0173 lastly you can reach us by mail at the employment development department attention watsi center at 2901 50th street Sacramento, California, 95817. Our customer service team is available for questions regarding the request and certification of the Work Opportunity Tax Credit. The WATC office is open Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Pacific time. Please note, the WATC office is not open to the public. And so, to summarize our presentation, let's review the main points we've covered today. First, we described the WASI program and how it assists individuals and employers. One of the benefits for employers is that they can receive a federal tax credit whenever they hire individuals with barriers to employment. Second, we identified the 10 WASI target groups and the five subgroups for veterans, as well as the tax credits associated for each group. Furthermore, we stated that the veterans target group has a processing preference allowing them to receive a priority of service over all other target groups as required by federal law. Next, we explain the application process for employers and the benefits of submitting the WASI application online. Finally, we provided the WASI contact information as a resource to answer any questions or provide assistance. Remember, although the WASI program is federally funded, it is administered by individual states and territories, and in California, by the Employment Development Department. As such, the WATSI program contributes towards EDD's vision and mission by strengthening California's economic vitality, growth and prosperity, and delivering valuable services to California's employers and job seekers. Thank you for joining us today. We hope this information was helpful and valuable. Don't hesitate to contact us for any assistance. And again, thank you. So this concludes our WATSI presentation. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you, Wendy and <clears throat> Karina. I think we will take questions after our next presentation, and we'll that way we'll take questions for um, all three of the presenters, if that works for you. Okay, that's fine. Thank I you. really appreciate you sharing about this important hiring and incentive for California employers. With that, we're going to transition <clears throat> and to hear from Lisa Brim. She'll be sharing the EDD's work sharing program. Thank you, Lisa. Good afternoon. I just want to make sure everyone can hear me first. I can hear you just if fine. Great, if we're good to go and you can see my screen. Indeed. Okay, great. So again, let me just introduce myself. My name is Lisa Brim, and I'm one of the section managers of the Unemployment Insurance um, Work Sharing Program. I've been in the Work Share Program for about 20 years, but currently, um, just to give you, I'm on a special project with our UI Support Division, and we're working on the automation program, um, the automation efforts for the Work Sharing Program. So just a quick summary of who I am, and we'll get started on the presentation. Okay, so today's agenda, we're going to cover the following items. Um, what is the Work Share Program? The benefits to the Work Sharing Program. We're gonna go over some high-level eligibility requirements. 
the work sharing process, um, how to calculate work sharing benefits, and recent um, work share changes that we've had due to our automation efforts. And I've added some helpful tips that um, when we've talked to employers and our staff about uh, applying for the work sharing program, and then we'll go over the resources and um, also a question and answer session. So what is the work sharing program? Work sharing program is an unemployment insurance program. So when we file a work sharing um, um, claim, it is an actual regular unemployment insurance program claim. Um, it was established back in 1978, and California was the first to pass actual work share legislation. Um, it is a temporary alternative to layoff, and it allows for the payment of unemployment benefits to employees whose wages and hours have been reduced, where they probably would not qualify for regular unemployment with their hours been reduced, so work share allows that. And back in 2014, the U.S. Department of Labor standardized the work sharing program, making it available for all states and territories. So the employer benefits, so as an employer, if you apply for the work sharing program, any business or industry can apply for work sharing. Um, it does reduce the payroll obligation, and I'll get into the um, grid of that a little bit um, later in the presentation. And you're able to retain your work, your skilled workforce. So, for instance, if you were to lay off, need have the need to lay off 20% of your um, workforce, you could just put them on work share and have everyone at a 20% reduction. And um, then if the work builds back up, you just tell them to come back to work full time and you don't have to rehire or train anyone. Um, so again, that helps you avoid recruiting expenses, hiring, and any training that you may need because you just bring your already trained workforce back to work full time. And then um, it meets the fluctuating business needs. So for instance, if um, you could use that reduction anywhere between a 10 and 60% reduction of, in, um, of time and hours and wages. And so the employee benefits, what your employees will do, they'll have their job retention, they'll be able to save their job. Um, the benefit, employee benefit retention, so um, one of the things to qualify for work share, and we'll get into it a little bit later, is any of uh, uh, their benefits should be retained at the same level that they were for all employees. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit more as we go further into this presentation. Um, they're not required to look for work, even though they will be eligible for unemployment insurance, because they're still attached to you as the employer. So again, there's um, some requirements where they may not be they may not be entitled to those benefits if they refuse work with you as the work share employer. And their unemployment benefits will supplement some lost wages. It may not supplement everything they're losing, you know, that whole 20% or 50% of, of being laid off and going to part time, but it does give them some supplement, which may help with like groceries or gas. So the eligibility requirements, um, it must be the employer to um, submit a work share application plan. And for it's, the employer must be the one that wants to participate. Um, they have to have the minimum of no less than two employees participating, and at least 10% of their workforce must be affected. So for instance, if you have 100 employees and you need to put um, them on work share, at least 10 have to be participating in the work sharing program. Their hours and their wages must be reduced by 10%, but no greater than 60%. So if they're a full-time employee, let's say they're a 40-hour-a-week employee, they have to be reduced by at least four hours, but no more than 24 hours. Um, the health and retirement benefits cannot be reduced. And the following may not participate in the work share program, any leased or temporary employees or any corporate officers 
or major stockholders with investment in the company and investment um, in the, the approval for the work sharing plan. So this is the work sharing process. This is, again, really high level. Um, an employer applies for a work sharing program. Um, he can do that now online or by paper. Um, and then the department, EDD, approves the work sharing program. The employer and the claimant must submit an initial application online. And again, that is now, they can do that online or by paper. Um, and then we, as the EDD, follow an unemployment insurance claim and we process the first week at the same time or within 72 hours. So, um, and then the employer and the claimant to continue, they would submit what's called a continued claim form, and it's the payment or the certification form. And again, that's online or by paper, it's your choice or the employer's choice. Um, and then we process those payment forms, and it just keeps going back and forth. And the claims are open for a total of 52 weeks or one year. And um, and then at that point, even the plan, they will have to reapply for a new plan. And your claimants, you can use it as you need. If you need to use it for um, two months and then go, your work increases and you go back to work for two months, you can do that. And then you can also um, then use it again for another four or five months. It's just however your work, um, however you need it as the employer. So I'm going to go over how to calculate or how we pay the um, work sharing payment. So for instance, um, let's say an employee works 40 hours a week. And normally when they work that 40 hours a week, the employer pays that employee $500 a week. And their hours and their wages have been reduced by a 20% reduction, which is one day of work. So that employee works 32 hours, and they're now paid for 32 hours of, of benefit. So that's a 20% reduction. Um, so they reduce the hour and pay by 20%. The employer pays um, the employee $400 because that's the 20% reduction. The if the employee's claim is 450 a week, which is the maximum in California, the EDD will pay 20% of that $450, which is $90. So in instance, that employee would just lose $10 in that their weekly benefit with their work sharing and their um, what their employer pays them. So recent changes that we've had to the work sharing program, um, prior to May 2020, everything was by paper only. Um, all the applications for the employer were by paper, all the certifications, all the initial claims, everything was, it was all paper driven process. And because of our automation efforts, we were originally um, just working on just the employer side, but when the pandemic hit, we realized we have to do more for our claimant and for our employer. So we pulled our team together and started working with um, other entities to help us create a new online work sharing account. And the employers can submit their forms online. Again, they have the option to do paper, but um, they can also submit online. And then that started in July 31st of 2020. And it was only for new employers at that point because we weren't able to merge the old employers or the employers that had already applied using the paper version. And, but as of October 17, 2020, now the existing and the old employers can create an online account and they can now submit claim forms and their initial forms and even their applications. And now we respond by email using the online application service. And we have some helpful tips that we found um, talking to our employers and questions that they may have had using the login account. So if an employer applies for work sharing, 
each employer account number, which is issued by California Unemployment Insurance, or EDD, um, and we call it EAN, must have a separate login. So if you have, if you're managing a company that may have more than one employer account number, each one has to have a separate login because you're going to list your employees, their full social security number, um, and what, what unit they may work in um, when you apply. And then only one email address can be attached to the employer account. So when the employer um, applies for work sharing and they create an online account, um, it, that's the same email that if you have more than one employee or you have a whole HR team that may be helping apply or submitting work share applications, they must have the same email address that they can use to log into the system. So um, if you are an employer that already has a work sharing plan um, before signing up online, you must link your account to the plan to manage your online account. And that requires knowing your again employee account, employer account number, and you should have received um, some type of letter from the department, uh, either an approval or a denial for the work sharing plan, in order to link your account. And also, we have updated um, EDD's work sharing webpage to provide several online um, how-to guides to assist in setting up and managing your online work share account. And again, this is for unemployment insurance only with the work sharing program. And if you wanna take a screenshot of, of this page, um, I'm fine with that. And it, we have several links. Um, one is to the actual work sharing webpage, which again, has the application. It has um, questions and answers. It has um, helpful hints. Um, there's there's a bunch of different and actually like I said how to pages on um, on how to apply and link your account and how to set up your online account. We also have um, again like I said the requirements um, and criteria um, publication. We have the fact sheet publication, and then there's the link to the online actual work sharing. And if you want to do it by paper, there's the actual paper DE8686, which is the employer's work share um, application. And now I'll, um, I guess we're going to go to the questions and answers after um, if there's another presentation to my understanding. But if they're not, I'm available for questions. And I just want to say thank you for um, allowing us to be able to present the work sharing program. It is not a program that we talk about very much. There's really not very much, um, there's no marketing for work share right now, but it's coming soon, marketing. Um, and they've also found that states that do participate in the work sharing program um, usually bounce back better financially in the future. They they come out of the economic downturn easier. The states that actually have work sharing. And like I said now, it is available to all 50 states in the territory. Um, and just one more thing I wanted to add. If you're an employer and you're considering the work sharing program, it's for your employees that you already have. And it, they don't have to be full time, but the reduction in hours and benefits must be based on what their normal what they were normally contracted for so okay. for instance if they were a part-time person working 20 hours a week then their reduction in pay and hours must be between that um 10 to 60 percent reduction in order for oh, them to qualify for those benefits and again i'm open for any questions that you may have Thank you, Lisa, so much for sharing uh, about this temporary alternative to layoffs, especially during such difficult times. So I know we have at least one question for this, and, and we have time for it. So I'm going to turn it over to Frank. And this question is for the Work Opportunity Tax Credit team. And the question is from Layla Tamburini, and she asked, 
do these tax credits apply to nonprofits? Only particular employers that it would be acceptable for. So for nonprofits, it's only for our veteran target group. So some of the nonprofits, um, the only target group that they can submit applications for would be for our veterans. Okay, thank you so much. All right, thank you again, ladies. California Energy Commission's Clean Transfer Transportation Program, formerly known as the Alternative and Renewable Fuel and Vehicle Technology Program, invests in projects that support adoption of cleaner transportation powered by alternative and renewable fuels. It is my pleasure to introduce Elizabeth John, Advanced Fuels and Vehicle Technologies Office Manager. Elizabeth, let's see. Hmm. One moment. Hello, Elizabeth. Can you hear me now? Oh, there you are. Fantastic. You guys are all just such rock stars. Thank you so much. All right. I think um, you're absolutely. teed up and ready to go. Okay, perfect. Um, so good afternoon. My name is Elizabeth John, and I'm here today representing the California Energy Commission's Clean Transportation Program. Um, specifically, I will be speaking about our low carbon fuel production projects and potential opportunities to advance renewable natural gas projects um, through partnership with all of you and through support of state funding. For some context, in California, transportation is a major source of harmful air pollution, and it is also our number one source of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, if you account for the upstream emissions for the production of fuels itself, transportation accounts for half of the state's global warming pollutant emissions. So legislation, regulation, and executive orders in California have sent a strong policy signal that California is moving in the direction of alternative fueled vehicles. This slide highlights some of the big policies and regulations of the past 15 years. Understanding the landscape and seeing that there's going to be a big push towards converting California's existing medium duty and heavy duty fleet, the CEC has proposed a long-term focus on alternative fuels, vehicles, and infrastructure for trucks, buses, and off-road equipment. Through administration of its clean transportation program, the CEC is providing funding to support projects that reduce greenhouse gas emissions within the transportation sector. The clean transportation program was established by California Assembly Bill 118 in 2007 and was extended through January 1st, 2024 through Assembly Bill 8. And the program is funded through a small surcharge of California vehicle registrations resulting in up to $100 million per year in funding for investment in vehicle fuel technologies. In addition to reducing greenhouse gas emissions, the program aims to fund projects that improve air quality, increase alternative fuel use, reduce petroleum dependence, and promote economic development. The statutes which created the Clean Transportation Program 
call on the CEC to develop a diverse portfolio of technologies without adopting any one preferred option. Accordingly, we have funded a broad portfolio of projects which target numerous fuel types and sectors. This slide demonstrates our proposed funding allocations for the next three years. So where do you all fit in? Um, the advanced fuel production category is one of the largest funding categories in our program. Since biofuels have the potential to provide the state with near and long-term opportunities to reduce petroleum use. Awards are divided into four fuel types, gasoline substitutes, diesel substitutes, biomethane, and renewable hydrogen. And of particular note, I would like to highlight our biomethane category. The Clean Transportation Program has invested over $70 million in 28 biomethane projects throughout the state. Projects awarded in the biomethane category utilize waste-based feedstocks and produce some of the lowest carbon fuel. These projects are often located in disadvantaged communities, bringing economic and job benefits where plants are located, as well as providing associated air and environmental quality improvements uh, to their communities. So for the upcoming year, we have about $15 million available in funding, which we plan to use to focus on fuel production of ultra low carbon fuels, including biomethane and renewable hydrogen. Additionally, the enactment of Senate Bill 1383 further amplified the need to reduce short-lived climate pollutants and help the state think of creative, way, creative ways to utilize waste resources. The bill directed the CEC in consultation with CARB, CPUC, CalRecycle, and CDSA to develop recommendations for the development and use of renewable gas, including biomethane and biogas, as part of our 2017 Integrated Energy Policy Report. Our report found that renewable gas production as a transportation fuel can generate up to four times the revenue compared to electricity due to LCFS credits. The report also recommended a focus on near-term opportunities to maximize greenhouse gas reduction benefits. And as an example, uh, we recommended using renewable gas produced from anaerobic digestion as a transportation fuel in low NOx emission heavy duty vehicles. We believe that biomethane provides opportunities for meeting California's climate change goals. For example, community scale facilities that produce biomethane from locally available feedstock that fuel local trucks. Additionally, renewable hydrogen production from biogas, which can be paired with zero emission fuel cell electric, light duty cars and medium and heavy duty trucks. To further highlight the potential, here is a map, here's a map of the waste feedstock resources in California. As a hypothetical, if we used all this waste to produce transportation fuel, the, the full potential would equate to about 19% of the 3.3 billion gallons of, gallons of diesel consumed in 2016, um, which is about 623 million diesel gallon equivalents of biomethane. And then I would like to quickly share some of the projects we have funded um, and then some of the lessons learned we have gained along the way. Um, first, I know this project was talked about a little bit earlier, but we have Rialto Bioenergy Facility which received funding from the CEC, totaling nearly $11 million for all three phases of its project. The latest phase of the project, phase three, is expected to construct a new biogas upgrading facility, which will process an additional 300 tons per day of organic waste, resulting in 4.8 million diesel gallon equivalents per year of new renewable natural gas for use in waste management refuse vehicles. For this project, um, CalRecycle also funded a digester for $4 million.
Next, we have the County Sanitation Districts of Los Angeles County. This project was awarded $2.5 million from the CEC to construct a biogas conditioning system at the CSD LA County's Joint Water Pollution Control Plant in Carson. This project will clean and compress biogas from digestion of 124 tons per day of pre landfilled food waste into over 760,000 diesel gallon equivalents of fuel per year. And CalRecycle also provided $4 million to support this project. And then my final example is um, the CRNR project. The CRNR project is located at the Paris Material Recovery and Transfer Station in Riverside County. This facility produces mixed municipal solid waste from the Riverside and Los Angeles areas to produce biogas. This project also had multiple phases, and CEC provided funding for two of the three, two of the three phases, totaling nearly eight million dollars in funding. And then. Um, something to highlight, this was also the first project in California to inject its biomethane directly into the SoCal gas, natural gas pipeline. So um, through our management of these projects, we have um, a lot of lessons learned. Um, I'm going to share a few of the ones we thought that were most important. So first, I think it's been a theme today, but where possible, work towards multi-agency collaboration. There are a lot of funding opportunities out there and each department has different goals. As you saw in some of the projects I highlighted, there was potential to partner funding with CEC and CalRecycle. And earlier today, we heard um, about CP, CFA funding as well. Second, um, I would highlight project readiness as a key to successful implementation. We suggest that if you're thinking of jumping into a project, get a head start on CEQA compliance, permitting, offtake agreements for your fuel, um, other local requirements that could impact the timeline of the project. These are things that we look for when we are reviewing project proposals. So it's really important to have an understanding of what this looks like for your project and how to get a head start. And then lastly, um, we suggest you gain an understanding of the emission and waste reduction benefits your project could have, um, not only for your company, but also for the state. These projects may not just make environmental sense, but also business sense. Um, we suggest looking into benefits like LCF credits to help make a business case for your project. Um, I know that was a lot of information, um, so I'm happy to take any questions, and I'm also leaving my contact information here if um, you'd like to um, talk to our team or if you have more questions in the future. Thank you, Elizabeth. I appreciate uh, CEC's important role in SB 1383 implementation as it relates to infrastructure development and creating markets for recycled organic materials such as low carbon transport transportation fuels easy for me to say uh, further the lessons learned you that you shared with us Elizabeth are invaluable on multiple level levels so I really appreciate that I want to see if we have any questions on your presentation and it I see none and I'm told there are none so fantastic and thank you again Elizabeth all right the California Infrastructure and Economic Development Bank, or iBank, has broad authority to issue tax-exempt and taxable revenue bonds, providing financing to public agencies, provide credit enhancements, and other financing support for small businesses, acquire or lease facilities, and leverage state and federal funds. We're incredibly fortunate today to hear about these programs from Lena Benedict, Loan Originer, Origination Manager, and Megan Hodap, Small Business Finance Center Loan Officer. Welcome, ladies. 
Thank you, Marshall. Um, can you see my screen all right? And can you hear me all right? Yes, uh, you're on your screen. Um, you can see your next slide. So I'm not sure it's in presentation mode. There. Um, um, I... That's how I have it. That's fine. That will be just fine. So oh, there you go. There we you're go. Pro. Fantastic. Th Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much um, for this fantastic public funding webinar. Um, Megan and I are very happy to be here to make this presentation. Uh, let me get started. Um, California Infrastructure and Economic Development Bank. We call it iBank for short. We are a state agency and we fall under the Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development, GOBIS for short. We were created back in 1994 by the state of California's legislature. The primary purpose was to strengthen the economy and to create jobs in the state of California. As Marshall mentioned, we do have broad authority to issue tax exempt and taxable bonds. We are essentially the state's green bank. Uh, we've issued almost $2 billion in green bonds up to date. Um, we are the state's only general purpose financing authority that supports both infrastructure and economic development in the state of California. Um, I want to talk about one of our new funds. Um, it is the Climate Catalyst Revolving Loan Fund. This was approved in, by the state legislature into the 2021 state budget. Um, we are in very serious efforts to get uh, funding for this uh, fund, both private and public. Uh, we've received um, millions of dollars so far, and we're in process of putting uh, criteria and guidelines together to lend under this fund. Um, we are primarily trying to align ourselves to the governor's greenhouse gas goal and the agenda when it comes to uh, climate and energy efficiency. There are a lot of green projects out there that need funding. And so this is actually a very critical fund that we have now. And we're very excited about this. You'll hear more about this as the days go on. Um, but um, the pipeline is primarily going to be clean projects, um, biomass, um, zero emission vehicles, uh, smart agriculture, those kind of projects are what we're going to be focusing on. There are two direct lending programs um, at iBank. The Infrastructure State Revolving Fund Program, ISERF, or the California Lending for Energy and Environmental Needs, or the CLEAN program. They're both direct loans, and to date we have closed over $740 million in direct loans under these two programs. There's a wide array of projects that are eligible. Under the ISERF program, water, sewer projects, roadways, police stations, um, airports, streetlights, those are all um, eligible under that program. Under the clean loan, um, any energy efficiency, conservation, environmental mitigation, those are all eligible uh, programs. You know, the question might arise under the COVID pandemic um, situation right now, are we still lending? Are we still underwriting? We are. Um, we do look at the COVID impact on the applicants and we underwrite um, to make sure that um, you know the revenues are there. We look at the disaster funds that the applicant may have in place and how they have handled disasters in the past. We do some stress testing. So our underwriting is creative and prudent and um, you know we are here to try and get loans uh, done. So that's our really our primary purpose. Who is eligible to apply under the ISAF and CLEAN? Um, really, any subdivision under the local government, cities, counties, water districts are eligible. Joint powers of authorities are eligible. We look a little bit at the revenue stream for JPAs and the members and the agreements that hold the members together. Um, we want to make sure that the revenue stream is consistent and also that the members are in place 
for the length of the term of the loan. Nonprofits are eligible um, as long as they are sponsored by a public agency. Per our government code, our sponsorship is really defined as does the public agency own the nonprofit? So we'll be looking at some formation documents to make that determination. What makes IBAN different? Um, we are um, we're able to do 100% financing. We don't have any scoring mechanism, so it's a first come first serve basis as far as the applicants go. There's no wait list and there's no application window. So we are open for, to receive applications throughout the year. In both the ISOF and clean loan programs, we have a 90 day turnaround. So from the time of application to taking it to the IBAC board for approval is about 90 days. Um, but we can underwrite earlier as well. You know, we've taken loans to the board in 30 days, 60 days. It depends really on what the applicant is looking for. And we also provide technical assistance for uh, borrowers who need it. The loan structures, um, there's a couple of different ways we structure these loans. If the repayment source is an enterprise fund, for example, if it's a water project or a sewer project, we take a pledge on the enterprise funds itself. If the repayment source is a general fund, so for example, if you're looking at the building of a civic center or a convention center, we would do a lease leaseback financing. The leased asset could be the project itself or really any building that is owned by the applicant free and clear. We can even do partial buildings. So um, there's a lot of flexibility in these programs. Here are some recent programs financed, um, projects financed by um, iBank. The city of Santa Cruz, we approved a $30 million loan in the third quarter of 2020. That was a um, sewage collection and treatment plant upgrade. It was much needed for the community and we were very happy and excited to do that project. The city of Galita, um, they were already in a building that they were using and they wanted to do some minor improvements to the building and purchase the building. And so we did that $10 million loan for them uh, for the city of Galita last year. Let me turn it over now to Megan Hodder, who is our Small Business Finance Loan Officer. Thank you. Thank you, Lena. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Megan Hodap. I am a loan officer with iBank's Small Business Finance Center. Um, I apologize. My slides are a little bit out of order, so I'm going to have to jump around a bit, but it's not too bad. I'll, I'll, I'll make it work. <laughs> um, so I am a loan officer with the Small Business Finance Center. We have a few different programs. Um, we are set to help small businesses access capital, which can typically be kind of tricky in the small business world. Um, we provide a credit enhancement, which mitigates some of the risk that lenders feel in providing loans for capital for businesses. So we have our traditional small business loan guarantee program. We have our disaster relief loan guarantee program. And then as of the COVID pandemic, we have the COVID-19 disaster relief loan guarantee program. And then we also have two direct lending programs, the Jumpstart program and the farm loan program. Next slide, please. Skip this one. Next slide. <laughs> Next slide. Okay, we'll go back to those two because I'm not ready to talk about the rebuilding fund yet. Um, so the Small Business Finance Center, as I said, um, supports small businesses throughout the state with our various credit enhancement programs. Um, our programs are meant to encourage lenders to provide funds to small businesses to help them grow and pro prosper. Um, our Jumpstart program is for low wealth entrepreneurs in low wealth areas, um, and it's up to $10,000 and it allows them to start their businesses. And then we also have the Disaster Relief Loan Guarantee Program. Next slide. Um, in fiscal year 1920, the Loan Guarantee Program worked with our partner FDCs and we guaranteed 470 loans for 240 million in loans. Um, we were able to assist businesses to report more than 15,000 jobs that were created or retained as a result of these loans. And um, we actually do have a couple of, oh, go back. 
we have a couple of our FTCs on the call and they are going to speak after me and they can go into a little bit more detail as to how they assist us and facilitate the program. Um, the loan guarantees can be used for a number of different things, uh, business expansion, inventory, your working capital, agriculture, disaster relief. Um, next slide. This is kind of an overview of the loan guarantee program terms. Um, our loan guarantee program and our disaster relief program are essentially the same thing. They just have a different guarantee percentage. And for the disaster relief, um, it has to be in an area that was declared a disaster. So on our traditional loan guarantee program, we can go up to an 80% guarantee, which with a max of $1 million. So whichever of those is first. Um, on our disaster relief program, we can go up to 95% guarantee. Um, the maximum term for our guarantees are up to seven years. Uh, the loan can be longer, but the guarantee will only go for seven years. And um, we consider a small business, any business in California with less than 750 employees. Um, and there are some fees to utilize our program. There's a two and a half percent fee on the guarantee amount plus a $250 documentation fee. Um, next slide. This is a case study on um, one of our uh, loans that we were able to help with. Um, basically, I don't know if anyone's ever heard of this before. They're called stasher bags and they are were our 1,000th borrower. Um, so she had a business that are bags that are silicone, plastic free and basically like reusable um, like sandwich bags kind of. Um, and she was having trouble getting capital in order to expand her business. Um, so she came to iBank and was approved for a loan guarantee through us and since then stature has expanded enough to go on shark tank and has experienced a lot more growth um originally they were only online with her website now they sell them at target and amazon and pretty much any retail store you can go to um so our infusion of capital was able to help her grow next slide This is just a little bit about our FDCs, our Financial Development Corporation partners. Um, like I said, they are the ones that facilitate the program throughout the state of California. We have seven of them. And this is kind of the breakdown of the FDC staff. Um, it's really important to note it's a very diverse group with a ton of lending experience. Um, and like I said, in fiscal year 1920, they made 470 loans, loan guarantees. Um, they can help process loan guarantees, disaster relief guarantees, um, jumpstart loans, and much more. Next slide. Um, this is a little bit of information about our COVID-19 disaster relief program. As I stated earlier, um, in April, the governor gave us a $50 million allocation, um, and we were able to in fiscal year 1920, do 141 disaster guarantees, resulting in more than 5.2 million um, in loan guarantees to businesses. And they reported 842 jobs were retained because of these loan guarantees. Um, it's important to note that 83% uh, of the COVID-19 loans have gone to kind of the target market of borrowers, um, either women or minority owned businesses or businesses that are located in a low to moderate income census tract. And there's a little chart here that shows kind of the breakdown of the, whether they're minorities, um, the dollar amount, the percentage of the loans and that. Um, next slide. So this goes back to the California Rebuilding Fund. Um, I'm not gonna have Lena go back to the slides. I'll just share what it says on those slides to here. Um, so the California Rebuilding Fund is a fund that I think had the pleasure of um, participating in the development of. It's a public private partnership uh, meant to increase capital and support for the smallest businesses in underbaked communities across California. Um, there are 12 participating lenders. Um, so the, the issue was um, people were having trouble accessing the federal pay, paycheck protection program as seen on this current slide. Um, so our solution to that was a statewide rebuilding fund program. So next slide. So these are the terms for that rebuilding 
loan fund, um, the interest rate on all of the loans is 4.25% fixed interest. The repayment term is 60 months. Um, they can be used for working capital, operating expenses, utilities, rent, supplies. There's no collateral required and there are no upfront fees. Um, the maximum amount of the loan would be $100,000 or three times average monthly revenue, whichever is less. Next slide, please. Um, the cool thing about the California Rebuilding Fund is with a lot of our programs, um, you have to reach out to the, the lender directly or you have to go through an FDC. The California Rebuilding Fund actually has its own portal and website. So you can go to that website um, and they'll have you fill out some information as a business and then they will match you with a lender who is willing to make the kind of loan that you're looking for. Next slide. Um, so that's really kind of all I have on our Small Business Finance Center programs today. Um, this is my contact information. If anybody has any questions, feel free to reach out to me directly. Wonderful. Thank you, Michelle. Mm -hmm. Thank you, ladies. I sincerely appreciate the scope, the broad scope of programs that iBank offers. And I'm again encouraged by the state's ability to create and adjust programs to excuse me to address current business needs. Also, we can see here clearly through your presentation again the interconnectedness of the programs and the importance of our collaboration um, on business assistance. I'm looking to see if there are any related questions. And I see none, and I'm told there are none. So with that, again, ladies, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Moving right along. As we just heard, financial development corporations, or FDCs, were created to aid the iBank's Small Business Finance Center in administration of its programs throughout the state. The FDCs aim to support small businesses and stimulate economic growth in underserved communities. Today, we are joined by representatives from two of the seven financial development corporation partners. We will then learn about additional lending options provided by one of the small business loan guarantee participating lenders. For this session, we're going to hold questions until we've heard from each one of our, our speakers. First, joining us is Nestor Correa to share about programs offered through Small Business Development Corporation of Orange County. Welcome, Nestor. Nestor. Can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Okay. Is my screen being shared? Yes, and you just need to put it in presentation mode and you'll be ready to go. Okay. Lovely. All right. Okay, everybody. Uh, thank you, Recal Recycle, for putting this together. Uh, I think it's a great program for them to know about all that the state does. Um, the State of California Loan Guarantee Program is actually going to be 52 years old. It started back in 1968 uh, to help with unemployment and to help small businesses and minority businesses. Um, so it was recreated in 1968. Currently, there are seven financial development corporations, FDCs that manage the program. They're sprinkled out throughout the whole state, San Diego, Los Angeles, Orange County, um, um, Fresno, Oakland, San Francisco, and Northern California. So they're spread out throughout the whole, uh, the whole state. Um, okay, I'm gonna start off with the Disaster Loan Guarantee Program um, because of course, all, a lot of businesses are, are being impacted by the disaster. So uh, for the disaster program, the maximum loan amount is going to be a million two fifty. Um, the maximum guarantee is going to be ninety five percent. So the lender only has a five percent liability. You can see in there where the maximum guarantee is. It is a tiered um, um, guarantee. The higher the interest rate that the that the lender uses, the lower the guarantee. So for example. Um, if it's going to be a 95% guarantee, then it has to be Wall Street Journal Prime plus one. Um, and then, of course, it goes higher. The guarantee goes lower as the interest rate goes higher. 
And basically, the loan is to help businesses that are impacted by the disaster. In this case, it's COVID. Uh, so we look at, at borrowers that are impacted by revenues. Uh, we try to qualify them using 2019 uh, financials because that's when everything was going good. Um, and the money has to be used for business purposes. Um, and it has to be a business um, that uh, has an ASICS code that uh, that's approved by us. So uh, your normal brick and mortar businesses, what we don't do is we don't do adult entertainment, speculative real estate, commodities, um, marijuana. We don't do any of those type of industries, but we do the majority of most businesses. And they do qualify for the uh, default uh, disaster program like they would for the regular loan guarantee program. So um, every time there's a disaster, fire, earthquake, um, this program kicks in and uh, we help with financing on this. We've done quite a few disaster loans, as uh, Megan mentioned, throughout the whole state. HFPC has done quite a few disaster guarantees and we're still looking at doing more. But really here, <clears throat> talk about the state loan guarantee program. As I mentioned, this program started way back in 1968 uh, and only had $30 million. Um, that $30 million lasted all the way to 2011 when we received money from the Jobs Act bill and the SSBCI. So at that point, we received about $84 million. Uh, CalCAPS also got $84 million. So right now, we're operating with a, with a trust fund of about $112 million that we can leverage 10 times. Okay. Oops. Okay. So the maximum guarantee is a million dollars or eighty percent, whichever is less. Remember that the the disaster guarantee is ninety five percent or a million dollars, whichever is less. The loans could be lines of credit or term loans, and as Megan mentioned, the maximum term is seven years. But when we're looking at real estate transactions, they're amortized over fifteen, ten, fifteen, or twenty years. Uh, obviously, after the seven years is over, our guarantee expires, but by then the lender has a better LTV with a reduced, uh, reduced balance on the loan as well as the increased uh, equity on the value of the property. The money can be used for all kinds of business purposes, working capital, equipment, uh, expansion, real estate. <clears throat> could also be used for um, acquiring other businesses. Um, we do look at uh, satisfactory credit history. Um, and of course the collateral is the best collateral available. All these transactions typically come from banks. Uh, most of them are community banks. Uh, you won't see the Wells Fargo or B of A's work in this program, but almost every community bank is working the program. We have about 84 different lenders, uh, community lenders that are working the program. So who's eligible for the program? What kind of businesses? Well, you can see the ones that are, are that are uh, eligible. One in, in particular that the SBA cannot finance is nonprofits. Our guarantee is open to nonprofits. Nonprofits like to buy buildings and equipment. They need money, a working capital for working contracts. So with our guarantee, we've been able to help a whole lot of nonprofits. So uh, I believe our, our organization has done the most loans to nonprofits. Uh, so far. But as I mentioned earlier, uh, it's a business that we can't do. Uh, as I mentioned, adult entertainment. Uh, we don't really deal with firearms. Um, we don't do night spots. Uh, we do do restaurants um, and, uh, and all your normal businesses. And I'm going through this as quickly as possible so that we, um, if you have any questions. This is a little bit old um, um, uh, chart here, but this is the top, the top lenders in the program by loan amount. So as you can see here, there's quite a few banks that are involved. There's also uh, uh, some CDCs. You can see Banker Small Business CDC is involved as well. Um, but these are the top 25 in 2019. Um, right now, we're trying to get the information for the, uh, the last fiscal year, and we'll be able to share that with everybody um, once we get that. As you can see, there's a, a bunch of lenders on here, but you don't see the larger uh, uh, banks because again, uh, they tend to utilize SBA and things like that. Oops, wrong mouse. Okay, what makes us different? What makes us different? Oops, my mouse is a little touchy here. 
Okay, so it makes us different than the SBA because the SBA is is kind of our our um, our, our counterpart as far our competitor as far as guaranteed lending is concerned. Of course, we don't have as deep pockets as the federal government, so we don't believe we're in competition with them. But you can do things with us that you cannot do with the SBA. For example, 7-Elevens or franchises that are not eligible with the SBA are eligible with our program. 912 issues. 912 issues are typically some kind of uh, a, a problem that a borrower had, some legal problem, and maybe was convicted of a crime in the past um, that they're not eligible, or you have to wait for the SBA to reply back to you, letting you know if they are eligible or not. Um, some of those issues can be, you know, a person that uh, had a marijuana uh, case a long time ago or drunk driving or those kind of things. Uh, so we're not concerned with those. Uh, we only look at, at things, uh, uh, violations of moral turpitude. That's when we that's where we cross the line. Um, if the borrower had defaulted in a previous federal loan, and it doesn't have to be an SBA loan to be a federal loan, uh, a lot of people use FHA to buy houses. That's a federal loan, and student loans are also federal loans. So if a borrower default on their student loan or their FHA loan, it doesn't preclude them for applying with us. They can still apply with us for a loan, uh, and we can still issue a guarantee for them. Another way, a reason why uh, banks come to us versus the SBA is because the borrower met their maximum in guarantee liability. So they're no longer eligible for any more guarantee liability from the, from the SBA, so they come to us, and um, of course, uh, uh, the our maximum for us is a million dollars. Uh, I mentioned um, so on refinancing. Now, this might be a little bit old slide because in the past you were not able to refinance, get away for two years. But I believe that might have changed. But that's also how we're used, where the SBA loan cannot be refinanced by another SBA loan. So they come to us for us to, to refinance it. Uh, so there's no real grace period or waiting period for us to be able to be involved. Nonprofits, as I mentioned, they're eligible. Um, we do quite a few of them. Um, they're impactful for the community. And of course, high net worth borrowers. With the SBA, if their net worth is over 15 million, they're not eligible uh, for SBA financing. Uh, with our program, we don't look at that. <clears throat> One other thing that's not on the slide here um, that I wanna mention is the fact that um, we can do loans to owners of businesses that are not US citizens. Um, and typically what we do with that is that we, we want somebody in management that is a U.S. citizen in case uh, the owner is overseas and cannot get back into the country for whatever reason. We have somebody here that can be able to uh, manage the company and keep it profitable. So that's the, uh, the, the, the state loan guarantee program. There's our contact information. I went through it as quickly as possible. Um, but all the loans come from lenders, so we have a whole list of lenders, um, and the SP and the website, the iBank website, has a lot more information about our total uh, number of loans that we've done with all seven FDCs combined. Uh, so, with that, if we have time for questions, I'll entertain any questions. But I, I think though that Carlos is up next. Um, thank, you. thank you, thank you, Nestor. So, I, I especially was impressed um, by the focus on the businesses in disaster areas. I hadn't heard about that before um, today's presentations. And we are going to take questions after we hear from um, Carlos as well as Tony. So stay tuned. Excellent. All right. Next, we'll hear about additional aspects of FDC services from Carlos Nakata with California Capital Finance Development Corporation. Carlos? Hi. Yeah, let me uh, arrange my, my screen over here a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Um, slide one. Let me see. That looks good on this end. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good.
Okay. No, good. Next slide. Okay. Uh, my good afternoon. My name is Carlos Encara, Credit Administrator for the California Capital Financial Development Corporation. Just a short introduction of who we are. Our mission is to provide capital and development assistance to increase opportunities for underserved communities by offering a wide range of flexible financial products and services. California Capital was chartered in 1982 to administer the state loan guarantee program. Today, we have multiple lending and business programs. This presentation will focus on one financing program, the Loan Guarantee Program. First, a brief mention of our oil financing program, RAST. The program will finance up to $750,000 for up to 20 years. It finances mainly the replacement of single walled tanks with double wall tanks to comply with SB 445. The deadline to comply is 2026. Micro lending, uh, we have a uh, several micro lending program. Uh, the range, the ranges from uh, $2,500 to $150,000. And recently we have uh, gotten in under an MOU, the uh, SMART program. The SMART program is for uh, nonprofit entities located in the city of Sacramento. This program lends up to $25,000. Okay, back to the loan guarantee. The loan guarantee program offers eligibility lenders a mechanism to provide loans to businesses that may otherwise be unable to obtain a loan under conventional underwriting. Um, stay loan guarantee program, uh, most of this was uh, mentioned by Nestor. The maximum loan is 80% and the uh, maximum amount is a million dollars, whichever is less. Uh, the bank can make a loan up to $20 million. Business must be in one of the industries listed in North America Industry Classification System, NICE. Next. Who are eligible applicants for this program? Here are the most common types of small businesses eligible for the program. And the programs are corporations, the C's and S are also eligible. Just a couple of quick definitions. Uh, sole proprietorships. Individuals that file a Schedule C, Schedule F, or has a fictitious business name or DBA. Nonprofit organizations are the charitable, charitable organization, nonprofit, or religious institutions that have repayment streams. Program eligibility. Eligible user proceeds. These are some of the common eligible users of proceeds. Um, Bridge loans, uh, equipment purchases, um, franchise fees, part of it, acquisition of land, equipment, and the most common one is probably working capital. Banks uh, also can finance, or the borrower can finance, the loan guarantee fees. Here's some of the eligible users by real estate holding companies. 
For the real estate holding companies to be eligible, they must meet the following requirements. 100% of rentable property acquired with a guarantee must be leased to one or more oper operating companies. And the operating companies must be an eligible small business, a guarantor or co-borrower, not sublease more than 49% of rentable square footage for a 16 building and 40% for new buildings. Uh, both holdings and operating company must uh, execute a lease with the term, a lease equal to the term of the guarantee, and provide personal guarantees by each natural person holding 20% 20 or more of either the passive or the OC. Here are the most common non eligible uses of proceeds. Uh, non business purpose, uh, we don't make personal loans. Fund any portion of SBA loan, guarantee or non guarantee. Enrolling same loan in two more credit enhancement program. Uh, those are the two loans for the same purpose initiated by the same at the same time and enroll in two different government guarantee programs. That's a real, real estate investment, repay, and, uh, and a few others. Facilities that are primarily used for gambling or to facilitate gambling. Business engaged in activities that are prohibited by law. Business engaged in speculativities that develop profit for, from fluctuating of price rather than through a normal course of trade. Uh, <clears throat> no, uh, there's still mention about marijuana. Marijuana is legal in California, but it's not federally, federally legal. A bank may be reluctant to loan money for fear of federal retaliation. Next. Okay, uh, how do we enroll a lender? I guess the answer is by enrolling him. Uh, you know, a lender must first certify is, possession, is in possession of sufficient commercial lending experience, financial and managerial capacity and operation skills. Lenders uh, must submit the lender certification to participate application each year. The iBank reviews certification quarterly to ensure continued eligibility. Here are some examples of eligible and non-eligible lenders. Uh, the eligible lenders are the usual uh, federal and state charter bank, savings association, CDFIs, Farm Credit System Insurance Corporation, or the institution with uh, iBank exception. We, we will then accept other financial institutions that uh, doesn't comply with the iBank rules, finance companies, brokers, payday lenders, and private party lenders. All right, when a guarantee loan defaults, the demand request process requires specific documents to be processed within a certain time frame. Delinquent letters are sent 30 days apart, and demand letter includes all data describing borrower default with corroborating documentation. During uh, 
During the demand request process, all collateral should be evaluated for liquidation by lender. Liquidated collateral must be deducted from the outstanding loan principle. Well, here's an example of how collateral liquidation affects a demand request. <clears throat> Suppose we have a principal loan balance of 10,500, liquidated collateral yields $5,000, the adjusted principal balance is $5,500. 10,500 minus five. With a guarantee percentage of 80%, the guarantee principal amount is $4,400. Also, uh, iBank or the, the loan guarantee program will pay for 90 days worth of interest from the default date. Well, 80% of that, 80% of 90 days worth of interest from default date. So we get the interest that we pay and also the principal, both at 80%. Well, this is our contact information for loan guarantee program. Please call Terry Checky. <laughs> and for Michael Landing, Judy Fletcher. Do you have any questions? Thank you, Carlos. We're going to take questions for you and Nestor after we and Tony after we hear from Tony, who's next. Okay, thank you. Uh, I wanted to thank you. And every time I hear about the Small Business Loan Guarantee Program, I learn something new. I really appreciate uh, you sharing your knowledge and experience. So to wrap up this session, we're fortunate to hear from Tony Barengo with the CDC Small Business Finance, CDC Capital Markets. About a, about a program offered as a small business loan guarantee particip participating lender. Take it away, Tony. Thank you, Marcel. Um, thank you all for joining today. I, uh, as, was, as was previously noted, I'll be talking about the SBA 504 loan program. Uh, the 504 loan program is primarily used for commercial real estate or fixed assets. And it's a fixed rate product, so it's uh, quite advantageous versus, you know, a variable rate product. So um, as we get through here, I'll just give you a little bit of background on uh, my company, CDC Small Business Finance. We were started in 1978 and have, you know, about 43 years in operation. Uh, we are headquartered in San Diego, but we have offices throughout California, um, Arizona, and we do some loans uh, in Nevada as well. So we are one of the most active CDCs. Uh, CDC stands for Certified Development Company, by the way, and you have to basically be approved to, to um, do these loans through uh, the SBA. Um, a quick snapshot of our lending volume in fiscal year 2020, we had done 282 approvals for about 290 million, and we funded 291 for just under 300 million. So. Uh, lots of activity for us um, and, you know, lots of experience. As you can see over our lifetime, um, nearly or a little bit over 6.6 .6 billion in total, total fundings and nearly 10,000 loans. Uh, we have the largest portfolio of 504 loans in the nation. We also offer here a community advantage product and I'll just touch on that real quickly. That is, you know, working capital or, um, you know, soft assets that, are uh, not eligible to be financed under the 504 program. Um, that's a small loan program up to $250,000. And then we have a variety of other lending services and programs. Uh, so what I wanna talk to you about today is, you know, why choose a 504 loan product? What are some of its benefits? Some basic loan structuring, uh, basic eligibility, a little bit of, um, you know, kind of a peek behind the curtain on the funding process and then share our loan officer contact information. Uh, as I mentioned before, we have staff throughout California, Arizona, and Nevada. So why choose 504? So as I mentioned before, it's a fixed rate loan product. The rates are excellent today. You know, they're comparable to like the 10-year treasury 
And so you can get a 20 or a 25 year fully amortized loan, uh, all in rate with the fees below 3%. Uh, that is only on the debenture piece. Uh, you will, uh, in order to do one of these projects or have one of these loans, you do need another loan from a bank. And we'll talk a little bit about that as well. But most of the time, the blended rates, when you consider what the bank is financing and what SBA is essentially financing, are in the fours or maybe even the high threes, depending on uh, credit quality. So it's a very rate competitive product. Um, you can finance up to 90% of commercial real estate and fixed assets. The, there's a small caveat here. If you're a startup or you're a single purpose property, you know, like a hotel, golf course, car wash, uh, some of those things, you have to, you have to put uh, an additional 5% down uh, as your down payment. And if you're both, then you're looking at a 20% down payment. Uh, but as you can see, 90% financing with a, you know, all in rate of below three on the debenture side is uh, pretty attractive terms. Basic structure here is, you know, what's commonly referred to as a 50, 40, 10 structure. Um, the debenture is takeout financing. So uh, each borrower will um, work with a participating lender and the lender will fund the project in two loans. So they'll fund the loan with 50% uh, of the project in one loan, and that's typically called the permanent loan. And then they'll fund a bridge loan or an interim loan for 40% of the project, and that's how you get the 90% financing. And then the down payment on most projects is 10%. The SBA debenture then comes in, and after the, the lender has funded its 40% bridge loan, and then pays off that loan. And so the borrower is left with the permanent loan with the lender, and then essentially the 40% of the project, the debenture is what it's called, with uh, the SBA. So you know you can do straight purchases, you can do construction. Um, if it is a construction loan, if there's improvements to the space, then funding will not take place, debenture funding will not take place until all the construction is completed. Again, it's takeout financing, and the SBA requires the project be done and the business um, occupying and operating from the space. Uh, again, a, a quick sample here of a basic loan structure. Um, we have you know, a $2 million purchase for commercial real estate. You'll have the bank at 50%, could be higher, uh, you'll have the interim loan at 40%, which is the 800,000 here that eventually gets taken out by the debenture. And then you have the borrower's down payment at 200,000 or 10% for your $2 million project. Uh, I mentioned earlier, you know, there are some fees. These all um, get wrapped into what you borrow. So, you know, if you take 800,000 to complete the project, uh, the fees here may make what you borrow about 824,000 does finance so you're not to come out of pocket with those and the debenture is always rounded to the nearest one thousand dollars and we'll talk about that in a minute uh, it has to do with the funding source um you you've heard nestor i think talk about some of the reasons why you know you may not want to or if, if you can't go sba why you may want to go with uh, a state guarantee uh, state loan guarantee uh, product and so just to reiterate some of the some of the requirements on the SBA side you know the the business that would be occupying the real estate or using the equipment needs to be a for-profit business uh, the project has to be located within the United States there are certain size standards as as Nestor mentioned you know 15 million for net worth um, and 5 million in profits and depending on the industry you know it may be, there is some flexibility um, you know, to, to, to change that to a, a sales met or possibly a number of employees metric. So there is some flexibility or at least some options if you're over the 15 million in net worth or the 5 million in average net income for the last two years. You need to pass what's called the credit elsewhere test. The SBA doesn't want to be um, basically making loans to businesses that could get conventional financing without its support. So the CDC and the bank on the, on the transaction will have to do an assessment of, okay, why couldn't this applicant uh, get, get conventional financing? Um, you know, we will go through that. You know, we have seasoned 
loan officers and and um, credit staff that know how to how to guide you through that. So most of the time, that's not an issue. But you know, if you are a you know highly liquid business and it's a very small project, um, you know, it can be sometimes hard to say, okay, you really couldn't get uh, conventional financing for this project. Um, franchise dealer license. So as Nestor said, 7-Eleven is not SBA eligible, but there are many franchises that are, um, you know, Subway, just, you know, you name it, a lot of franchises are eligible. Dealer agreements, something similar, you know, if you're a new car dealer or, um, you know, a license, any type of a licensing agreement, those have to be reviewed and pass SBA's, um, SBA's guidelines. The business, the operating company needs to be owned by either a U.S. citizen or a legal permanent resident, at least 51%. And the business needs to occupy at least 50, 51% of the uh, commercial real estate. If it's ground up construction, it's a higher percentage, um, 60% if you're doing, you know, if you're building a brand new building with, uh, with the funds. There are some job impact or public policy goals. Uh, but again, that's generally not prohibitive to obtain the financing. Um, usually those are fairly easy to qualify for and, you know, our staff could, um, can certainly help uh, make the arguments that are necessary to move beyond those benchmarks. Um, only tangible business assets are allowed to be financed. So like I mentioned before, commercial real estate or heavy, heavy machinery and equipment you know, and the soft costs associated with those projects or construction as well. Uh, you know, we don't finance working capital. We don't finance inventory, can't pay franchise fees. Um, so it's really focused on, you know, commercial real estate or uh, fixed assets. There is one exception, and that is if you're doing an eligible refinance project, you are allowed to take up to 20% out, 20% of the value of the property as working capital for the business, provided you can demonstrate the need to use that money over the next 18 months on you know, salaries, rent, marketing, the typical you know, op operating expenses, I would say. Uh, it is takeout financing only. So again, you need a, you need a lender to, do, to finance the 50% loan and then a 40% bridge loan and then the SBA debenture comes in and pays out, pays off the bridge loan um, when, when it's ready. And then the business needs to demonstrate repayment ability from historic financials or well-supported projections. So, you know, typically the term in the industry is a debt coverage ratio, just basically measuring um, cash flow from the business, generated from the business versus, you know, existing and proposed debts. And that needs to be at a one-to-one -one ratio. So your, your cash flow needs to be able to show repayment of your of your debts, or if um, you know this is a, a projection-based loan, then the projections need to be really well supported. Uh, the basic funding process. So uh, there are CDCs throughout the country, and every month uh, the funding process works, where they aggregate all the debentures that need to be sold, and then those are sold in increments of a thousand, and then those are grouped together, and then they pay off the bank's interim loan. Um, so it's a process that occurs only once a month, and it is because the source is essentially raising funds from Wall Street. So these debentures are sold in the secondary market. That debenture is guaranteed by SBA, and that is ultimately the funding source that pays off the 40% bridge loan that you know we've talked about uh, throughout the presentation. Uh, like I said before, the typical or the kind of the benchmark rate is comparable to the 10 year treasury. So, you know, rates are really low right now. It's an attractive product. Um, I, I put our sales team on here. They're all by market. Um, and you can go to our website or the link here and find somebody who's in, you know, your area. If you think, you know, you're in the, in the market for a 504 for real estate or for, um, you know, fixed assets equipment. And you know you can reach out to them, and they'll you know start the process for you. They can even help you find a uh, permanent lender. You know if you don't have a bank that you bank with or that you didn't want to use, uh, they can help you source one as well. Um, so that one's that's it, Marshall. Oh, that was fantastic! Thank you for the incredibly informative 
overview of SBA 504 loan product. product. And it's it. also really uh, helpful between the three presentations, um, in addition with the iBank presentation, to really see the different kinds of options and um, what considerations you need to take into account to see which product works best for you. So with that, I think we have one question for the panel in general. And this one, I think it's related to disaster. So that might be Nestor, but I'll let you guys figure it out. I'll turn it over to Frank. So the question comes from Nicole Ty. And she a little asks, louder? Yes, the question comes from Nicole Ty. And she asks, do disaster loans only apply to businesses that were physically damaged or if they were financially impacted? If financial, what are the financial impacts that qualify? Okay, well, with the disasters, um, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, I hear you perfectly. This is a disaster. Uh, yeah, when it comes to disasters, it depends on what kind. So for example, in 1992, they had this civil disturbance in LA. So that was a man-made physical disaster where they were burned down stores and everything. So those businesses were eligible for physical um, uh, damages and economic damages. So they would get money for how to fix up the place, all the inventory that was lost and burned and everything. Then they would get economic injury money to pay the rent um, and, and get employees in and those kind of things. Um, so, um, but that's what you do with, with a disaster, uh, loan. So what we look at is basically 2019 is the last year before this kind of disaster. Okay. This is unlike any kind of disaster we've ever experienced. It wasn't an earthquake. It wasn't a dist civil disturbance. It wasn't the fires. Um, this is something that's ongoing. Every other disaster we've ever had happened and then you move forward. We're not done yet with this disaster. So this could go on for the rest of this year, but we look at their financials. 2019 was a regular year. So we can see from 2020 to 2019, the loss of revenues. So they're eligible. So we would look at their, when they were eligible in 2019, where they had income and everything, we would use those figures to qualify them. And the money uh, in this case here, because it's an economic injury, uh, it would be for anything that they had to use for working capital, employees, if they didn't get enough for the PPP, uh, inventory, insurance, your lease, um, electricity, all the things that you have to pay for. Um, so the program is still uh, active right now. Uh, we have some lenders that are willing to work with it. We, most of the CDCs, uh, like, like your organization, Tony, they stepped up. The CDC stepped up and did, uh, I don't know, 100 and some odd disaster loans. Um, the banks, unfortunately, are not in the position right now to work disaster guarantees because they're still worried about their clients and not sure what's going to happen with their clients. Um, so the disaster guarantee, you have to go to a lender. Um, on, the, on the iBank website, there's a list of lenders that are eligible, or you can give me a call. Uh, and I can try to find a lender in your area to get a disaster guarantee. But don't forget the stimulus coming up. They're going to be doing PPP again. They're going to do EIDL again. And it sounds like the federal government are going to do grants as well. And we didn't mention it, but California has a grant program of $25,000. You just have to be an eligible business and have been in business before the pandemic. Um, so um, there's quite a few th different things coming down the line where you may not need financing. That's your question? Yes, it did. Thank you, Nestor. And we don't have any more questions for this group of presenters. I just want to thank you gentlemen so much for sharing your experience. And even though there um, was a little bit of overlap, I felt like you guys complimented each other really well. Thank you again. Thank you. All right. So we have one more addition. We're going to have Arlene. Oh, she's already there. 
We're going to load a couple of slides here. So unfortunately, um, there were a couple of presenters that were unable to join us today, but the programs are so, um, or the resources, uh, we just had to let you know about them. So the first one is the Air Resources Board, Carl Moyer Program. It provides monetary grants to private companies and public agencies to clean up uh, their heavy duty engines beyond that required by law through retrofitting, repowering, or replacing their engines with newer and cleaner ones. So just a heads up that solid waste collection vehicles are um, identified as eligible under this program. So these grants are issued locally by air pollution control districts and air quality management districts. Not all air districts fund every type of Carl Moyer program project available. So please contact your local air district for the most important, uh, most updated information on funding availability, project eligibility applications, and application selection timeline. There's a link to, at the bottom of this slide to it's um, what's showing is a picture of their webpage. Um, it's very comprehensive. You can also email them or give their uh, hotline a call, which is all designated here on this slide. So if you're interested, uh, maybe do a screenshot of this slide or we can post it in the comments if it's gone too fast for you. The next is the California Water Board's Clean Water State Revolving Fund Program. Oh, oh there we go. <laughs> this program offers low cost financing for a wide variety of water projects. The program has significant financial assets and is capable of uh, financing projects from less than $1 million to more than $100 million. This program is applicable to any city, town, district, or other public body created under state law, including state agencies. So under eligible projects and the construction of publicly owned treatment facilities, an anaerobic digester at a wastewater treatment plant would be included. So on the screen is your contact at the Water Board. And again, if you visit their website that's, uh, that's noted here, it's very comprehensive, lots of great information. Um, I encourage you, you know, if you're considering a wastewater uh, or anaerobic digester at a wastewater treatment plant, please look into that. So let me see here what we have. Um, and with that, um, we, are, we are at the end of our um, webinar for today. Um, I just wanna thank you all for tuning in. We're hoping that um, you found the resources helpful as Marshall mentioned in the beginning, um, this webinar is being recorded and the presentations are gathered. So once we can have all of that, um, make sure it's ADA compliant, uh, we will post it on our web. Um, we wanna thank all the presenters for sharing their resources with us today. It was no small feat bringing everyone together, um, but thank you so much for um, being a part of our presentation today. In the meanwhile, if you have any questions, you can um, email the LAMD inbox, the LAMD at calrecycle.ca.gov. Um, and I think that also in prior emails, if you got an invite, you probably got it from me, you can email me directly and I'll make sure um, your questions get addressed. So on behalf of Marshall, myself, Frank, and Kara Morgan, thank you all for joining us today. Bye-bye.